Welcome to the City Council's March 1st Special Council Meeting. This is a hybrid meeting with City Council, City staff, and members of the public participating in Council Chambers in accordance with public health guidelines for in-person meetings and participating remotely to promote social distancing in this federal, state, and local emergency. I would like to introduce City Council members and staff present in the City Council Chambers, Vice Mayor Jen Willison, City Council Member Drew Combs, Interim City Manager Justin Murphy, City Attorney Nira Doherty, and City Clerk Judy Heron. City Council members and staff are participating remotely are City Council Member Ray Mueller and City Council Member Cecilia Taylor. City Clerk Heron, would you please provide instructions to the City Council and members of the public on how the meeting will proceed? Thank you, Mayor Nash, and again, echoing a welcome to our special city council meeting of March 1st. We ask that the city council remain off screen for the duration of the meeting, engaging their webcams when um, requesting to speak or ask questions. For members of the public who wish to provide public comment on an item, we ask that after the mayor calls for public comment on that item, you engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, you can press star nine to raise your virtual hand. And that does conclude my introductions at this time. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now go to agenda review. Agenda review provides advance notice to members of the public and city staff of any modifications to the agenda order and any requests from city council members under city council member reports. Does the city council wish to pull or modify any agenda item? Seeing none, our next item is the closed session. City Clerk Heron, please call for public comment on the closed session item. Thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on item D1, conference with legal counsel existing litigation, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you are calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine now. This will be the final call for public comment on our closed session item D1. Seeing no hands raised, Mayor Nash, you may continue. Thank you. The city council will adjourn to closed session and reconvene immediately following the closed session. We are, we are anticipating closed session to be approximately 60 minutes. Thank you.
having all of our city council members return to our virtual and in-person dais. Mayor Nash, you may reconvene the meeting. Thank you. I would like to introduce City Attorney Doherty for a report out from the February 15th, 17th, 18th, and March 1st closed sessions. Thank you, Madam Mayor. There's no reportable action. Under the consent calendar, the City Council may take action to approve routine business items in one motion unless a City Council member, City Staff member, or a member of the public requests that an item be discussed or continued to a later date. City Clerk Heron, please call for public comment on the consent calendar. Thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on tonight's consent calendar, item F1, City Council Minutes, F2, amending the city council policy for commission and committees, procedures, policies, roles, and responsibilities. Item F3, authorizing the city manager to extend the joint use library initiative MOU with Ravenswood School District. F4, adopt a resolution accepting and appropriating the California State Library Grant. F5, a resolution to update the following of the below market rate housing program guidelines and F6 adopting a resolution to continue conducting the city council and advisory body meetings remotely. Please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, you may press star nine now. And as I call the names for our public commenters, if you can please let us know which item you are commenting on. Our first public speaker will be John Borch. John, would you like to address the city council on a consent calendar item? Uh, John, I will come back to you. Our next public commenter will be Pam Jones. Good evening, Council. Pam Jones, resident of Menlo Park. Uh, item uh, uh, F5. And my comment uh, is this, and is to include some type of mandatory reporting requirement so that we know whether or not um, the policies are being followed, uh, particularly in, in uh, apartments that are rentals under the, fall under the um, BMR guideline. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So again, returning to John Borscht. You could please uh, let us know which consent item you wish to speak on. I don't wish to speak on the consent calendar. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and lower your hand. And when the mayor calls on the item that you wish to speak on, we'll ask that you engage it at that time. Thank you. Thank you. So this will be the final call for a public comment on our consent calendar, items F1 through F6. Seeing no hands raised, Mayor Nash, you may continue. Thank you. I was wondering if we have any staff available to uh, respond to the comment from Pam Jones about including mandatory reporting requirements um, in the BMR housing program guidelines. Uh, good evening, Mayor Nash. This is Mike Noche, Acting Housing Manager. Uh, can you hear me okay? We can. Hi, Mike. Good evening. Uh, yeah, so I'm happy to, to respond to that, that question. So in our uh, 
in our BMR agreements uh, with every developer. Uh, the provision is typically on or by July 1st of every year. Um, those um, properties do have to provide a report to the city or the city's designee, which would be our BMR administrator. So you're saying that this is already part of the BMR guidelines and is not needed or is not needed because it's handled in another fashion? I, I would have to look at the BMR guidelines specifically to see where which section references it, but I know it is a, a common practice that's in, I would say, all of our BMR agreements with developers. Thank you. Um, City Attorney Doherty, please. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yes, Mike is correct. Our standard BMR agreements require annual reporting. The BMR guidelines do not specifically specify the reporting requirements that are required. However, the agreement, um, all of our standard BMR agreements require um, the applicant, the uh, owner, operator, and or manager of the um, housing development to provide annual reports on one, the income levels of each of the um, uh, recipient, uh, each of the uh, residents in the BMR units, um, verification of income levels, um, and then which units are rented and at what um, sizes. Thank you very much. Okay. Vice Mayor Wellison. Thank you. So to follow up on that, the um, requirements that we're discussing in the consent calendar tonight about um, accessibility, like uh, qualifying criteria, that is not something that's reported on. If we were interested in having that be included um, in the reporting, is that, what would that look like? And is that, um, my sense is that, uh, the public commenter was interested in some type of verification to ensure that the qualifying criteria is met. But I don't know if you have any comments about that. Yeah, I would, yeah, thanks, Mike. I, I might look to Mike in terms of the verification of um, eligibility criteria with respect to the list. Sure, I'd be happy to, to add to that. Uh, so the uh, eligibility requirements, uh, that is something that, that staff looks at as uh, units come online. Um, so it is something that we, we do track internally. Um, the guidelines themselves are really meant to, to provide a framework for the operations of the, the BMR program. So staff um, basically follows best practices uh, throughout the, for the housing industry, or at least uh, on, on behalf of the city um, to make sure that the developers are, are providing the uh, required number of units and the type of units that they need to uh, with the standards of the building code, as well as the BMR guidelines. And I'm, I'm happy to elaborate further or, or answer any additional specific questions on that. Uh, that's very helpful, Mr. Noche. So it, it sounds like in order to get the unit um, those eligibility requirements would need to be met. And then if there was any questions or concerns about whether the current tenant was meeting that criteria, that's something that the staff might have internally or be able to follow up. Yes, yeah, so the, uh, that, that's correct. The, the agreement uh, itself, as well as the BMR guidelines, uh, ensures that staff has the ability to, to enforce uh, the the. Uh, specific uh, number of units or type of units that are that are meant to be offered um, in that specific development, okay. just speaking broadly. Thank you very much. Are there any other city council discussion or questions on the consent calendar? Is there a motion and a second on the table to approve the consent calendar? I move. I'll second. Thank you. City Clerk Heron, please state the motion and call for this vote. Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by 
City Council Member Combs and a second by Vice Mayor Willison to approve the consent calendar. Any further City Council question or discussion? Seeing none by a roll call vote, City Council Member Combs? Yes. City Council Member Mueller? Yes. City Council Member Taylor? Yes. Vice Mayor Willison? Yes. Mayor Nash? Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. We will now go to the public hearing. This public hearing is a formal proceeding held in order to receive testimony from all interested parties on a proposed issue or action. The first public hearing is G1, declare a water shortage emergency pursuant to water code section 350, adopt stage one drought measures pursuant to the city's 2020 water shortage contingency plan and adopt a water conservation plan implementing state water resources control board emergency regulations. To introduce this item is Senior Civil Engineer Pam Lowe. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Good evening, Mayor Nash, Vice Mayor Wilson, and City Council members. Tonight we are holding a public hearing for a water shortage emergency. Staff is recommending three actions. One, declare a water shortage emergency. Two, implement drought stage one per the adopted 2020 water shortage contingency plan. And three, adopt a water conservation plan. Menlo Park Municipal Water purchases all of its water from the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission and provides that water to roughly half of the city, the pink areas shown on this map. As we all know, California is in a drought. In December, there were big storms and we were hopeful for a wet winter season, but January and February have been very dry. I'd like to provide a snapshot how our water wholesaler, SFPUC, has been responding to the drought and how we are currently doing. In November, SFPC declared a water shortage emergency and adopted a voluntary 10% reduction system wide. And in January, SFPC established monthly water budgets for each of its wholesale customers, including Menlo Park Municipal Water. These monthly budgets are based on the water shortage allocation plan outlined in the current water supply agreement with SFPC. The plan has two distinct components. The tier one plan, which allocates available supplies between San Francisco retail and wholesale customers, and the tier two plan allocates water between the wholesale customers. SFPUC will provide monthly reports comparing wholesale purchases to the budget and a cumulative summary each month for this calendar year. With voluntary reductions, they will not impose excess use charges if water purchases exceed monthly budgets. However, this will change if they move to mandatory reductions in the future. On this chart, the blue line represents the SFPUC monthly water budget for Menlo Park Municipal Water. We can see that the winter months are lower representing indoor water use and that water use increases in the summer months with outdoor watering. We recently received our first report from SFPUC for January. The red dot represents our wholesale purchases for January, which is 4% less than our monthly budget. The city adopted a water shortage contingency plan in May, 2021. The plan ident identifies how Menlo Park Municipal Water will reduce demand and augment available supply during single and multiple dry years. It lists actions for six drought stages ranging from up to 10% water reductions to greater than 50% water reductions, and it lists conservation measures and responses for each stage. It recognizes that water regulations may be adopted by the State Water Board and or SFPUC, and it allows flexibility to incorporate additional conservation measures. 
The plan states that the city will follow Water Code Section 350 to declare a water emergency, which requires holding a public hearing and giving appropriate notice to the public. In July, Governor Newsom expanded the drought emergency to additional counties, including San Mateo County. And in October, he expanded it statewide to all 58 counties. He also encouraged the State Water Board to prohibit wasteful water uses. The State Water Board did just that and its emergency regulations became law in January. The state's regulations consist of seven prohibited actions. Some of these may sound familiar as they were implemented in the last drought, such as preventing runoff when watering landscapes and using a hose automatic shutoff nozzle to wash vehicles. The regulations will remain in place for one year and agencies are able to enforce them through infractions of up to $500 per event. There are also exceptions for using water for health and safety needs. As a result of the emergency declaration by the governor, the water code requires that each agency implement either one drought surcharges or two establish individual budgets for each customer and enforce an ordinance with fines for water used above established budgets. It would be time, in, time intensive to establish, monitor, and enforce water budgets for each individual water user, and the city's adopted water rates already sets forth drought surcharges. Per our municipal code on water conservation, the city must adopt a water conservation plan in order to implement regulations imposed by the state and or SFPUC. The water shortage contingency plan lists six drought stages. Stage one represents water reductions up to 10%, stage two up to 20%, and so on to stage six for water reductions greater than 50%. The city council must declare the drought stage, incorporate state and or SFPUC regulations, and has flexibility to add other drought measures. The third column shows the drought surcharge for each stage. The purpose of the surcharge is to recover lost revenues due to less water sales for the water fund. These surcharges were included in the adopted 2021 five-year water rates and they would apply to all customers based on total water used. Implementing the stage one drought surcharge meets state law. Staff recommends starting the surcharge on July 1st in order to allow sufficient time to notify customers and coordinate with the billing contractor. As mentioned previously, the city council has flexibility to add other drought measures. The water shortage contingency plan lists five additional measures for drought stages one and two that are not already included in the state's regulations. These were implemented in the last drought and water customers may already be familiar with them. Staff is recommending adding these to the water conservation plan. To get an idea what other agencies are doing in regards to drought, staff surveyed six other Bosca agencies. If Palo Alto adopts stage one at their upcoming March 8th city council meeting, then four agencies, including Cal Water, will be in stage one and two agencies in stage two. At this time, two agencies have drought surcharges. SFPUC is planning to impose a 5% drought surcharge for their San Francisco retail customers starting April 1st and the city of Brisbane has had a drought surcharge since February, 2018. With both the state and SFPUC declaring a drought emergency, staff is recommending the city council take the following actions. One, declare drought stage one. Two, adopt a water conservation plan that lists the state's regula regulations and the additional five conservation measures and three, implement the stage one drought surcharge on July 1st. That is the end of my presentation and we are more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Are there any clarifying questions from city council before we open the public hearing?
All right, I would like to open the public hearing. City Clerk Heron, please call for public comments on this item. Thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on our first public hearing item, G1, declare a water shortage emergency pursuant to water code section 350, adopt stage one drought measures pursuant to the city's 2020 water shortage contingency plan and adopt a water conservation plan implementing state water resource control board emergency regulations. Please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine now. And our first speaker will be Pam Jones. Oh, hello again. And I'm not sure actually which one, G1 or G2, that my comments belong to because it, um, they're uh, in incorporated in both. Um, I don't know how many of you remember the 70s when we were told to put bricks in our water tanks and to share ba bathing water. Um, I do. And, and some of us have, re have kept our water usage down um, uh, consistently for all of these decades. And I, what I'm wondering is how, how will people know whether or not they, they have a, um, they're going over their limit? How is the limit established? Back in the day, it was per person and household. Are we still doing that? Um, how are we encouraging people to have um, drought resistant yards? We know that there's an extraordinary amount of grass around here that has a lot of water going to it. Um, we need to have a plan that is um, a normal plan. It's consistent because even though droughts have been cyclical, they are now longer and longer. And eventually it'll just be one long um, drought season. And the other piece to keep in mind that when we save water, that doesn't mean we're putting it in the water bank account. That doesn't mean that because today I saved water, and now it's raining, so I just use whatever amount of water that I want to use. We need to come up with a, a stable, permanent plan. And I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker, um, it is a phone number, so I will ask you to state your name for the record. Phone number ends in 6751. So we have- Hi, yes. Oh, perfect, thank you. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thanks. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I was agreeing with what uh, the other young lady was saying. Um, uh, we, too, used uh, bottles, uh, the liter bottles in our, our toilet tanks uh, to try to reduce even more water. Uh, and that's a concern. It's just, she was saying, to you know, how do we establish each household? Uh, you know, how do we, do we know that what's a true number? Uh, how many how much water each, each house is, is using um, so that's a concern for me uh, another concern for me that I have and I know this happened a couple of years ago or maybe sooner where a couple of the counties uh, they also were and uh, uh, conservative conservative water mandatory and and then the following year uh, they raised the prices due to the fact that they wouldn't get enough money uh, for the, the sewage use. Uh, that's a concern because it seems like, you know, you want us to conserve, but then we'll get punished down the road because the county and the state and the cities are not making enough money because we're not using enough. So basically we're in a double-edged sword here. So that's another big concern that I have, or me personally, and I don't know if anybody else has that, problem with that. Um, it's just like, you know, you want us to reduce gas for gasoline cars. The less we drive, you know, and then 
you know, you've got to get that money from somewhere else. So, but that, anyways, that's my comment on that. So I appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, before you disconnect, if we can just have your name for the record. Yes, uh, Victor. Thank Bob you. Here. Okay. And so this will be the final call for public comment on item G1, our first public hearing of the evening. Seeing no further hands. Mayor Nash, you may continue. Thank you. I will now close the public hearing and open for city council discussion. So would anyone like to start or should we, um, let's see. I guess um, it, perhaps we can um, start by, if staff would, um, is available to answer the questions about um, how people know what the limit is and when they exceed it. So we actually have not and do not plan at this point in time to establish budgets for each individual customer. We will be relying on educating customers um, just on water conservation measures. Um, we do have quite a few of rebate programs that are online on our water conservation webpage, but we will not be going after individuals because we do are not setting budgets for each individual account. Thank you. There are tiers, aren't there? And is there any way for someone to know at what point they um, exceed one tier and go into another tier of usage? So we do have three tiers. Our first tier is from zero to six, um, 100 cubic feet of water, and then seven to 12, and then anything above 12 units is the third tier. Um, one way to, to find out is um, we have a new project that's in place to actually install or we plan to have in place soon is an advanced meter infrastructure project to install AMI meters that will allow customers to access their usage on an hourly basis. And when that is up and running, there will be a customer portal that will allow um, the public to access their records. They can gauge to see how much water they're using. They will be able to set alerts for leaks um, and that type of thing. And then that ho we're hoping that that will um, cause people to be able to become more aware of their water use and possibly adjust accordingly. Excellent, thank you. And any idea when that might be available? So uh, we do plan to come back to council. We're hoping in April with an agreement for the work and we estimate it will take 18 months to complete. Wonderful, thank you so much. Are there any other council questions? at this time. All right, is there a motion and a second on the table then? Vice Mayor Willison. Yeah, I'll go ahead and uh, move to declare a water shortage emergency pursuant to water code section 350 adopt stage one drought measures pursuant to city's 2020 water shortage contingency plan and adopt a water conservation plan implementing state water resources control board emergency regulations. Thank you. Council member Combs. I'll second. Thank you. City clerk Heron, please state the motion and call for the vote. Thank you, Mayor. So at this time, I have a motion by Vice Mayor Willison and a second by City Council Member Combs to declare the existence of a water shortage emergency condition, adopt and implement the city's stage one water shortage contingency plan, and adopt a water conservation plan by resolution pursuant to the Menlo Park Municipal Code Chapter 7.35 to enforce the State Water Resources Control Board's emergency regulations prohibiting wasteful water use practices. Any further city council question or discussion? 
Seeing no hands, by roll call vote, City Council Member Combs? Yes. City Council Member Mueller? Yes. City Council Member Taylor? Yes. Vice Mayor Willison? Yes. Mayor Nash? Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Now we go on to the next public hearing. This public hearing is a formal proceeding held in order to receive testimony from all interested parties on a proposed issue or action. The next public hearing is G2, introduce an ordinance to amend municipal code chapter 7.35 on water conservation, which provides for enforcement of conservation measures in the water shortage contingency plan. To introduce this item, we again have senior civil engineer, Pam Lowe. Hello, everybody again. Can everybody see the new uh, the screen? Just want to make sure before I start. Not yet. Okay, let me see. Sorry about that. Is it up yet? Yes, it is. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Nash, Vice Mayor Wilson, and City Council members. Tonight, we are holding a public hearing to amend the Municipal Code on Water Conservation. This is a familiar slide. Menlo Park Municipal Water purchases all of its water from the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission and provides that water to roughly half of the city. I discussed the water shortage contingency plan in the public hearing for drought. So this is the same slide with the addition of an item bolted at the bottom. The water shortage contingency plan includes enforcement measures to achieve conservation. The city's municipal code on water conservation provides the city with flexibility to respond to any drought emergency or reductions in available water supply. The water shortage contingency plan is not enforceable in itself, and the current code does not allow for enforcement. Also, new state water board regulations often have their own enforcement mechanisms, such as the recently adopted emergency regulations, so the city does not need to adopt them. However, the municipal code states that the city shall adopt a water conservation plan in order to enforce state and or SFPC regulations. Staff is proposing two revisions to the, to the municipal code. One, provide for enforcement of mandatory conservation measures upon declaration of a drought emergency by city council. This includes regulations adopted by the state, SF and SFPUC. Change, change the city shall adopt to the city may adopt by resolution a water conservation plan to enforce these regulations. Staff's recommendation tonight is to introduce an ordinance to amend Municipal Code Section 7.35 on water conservation. Staff will return on March 22nd to adopt the ordinance, and the ordinance would become effective after 30 days. If adopted, the ordinance would improve our efficiency and allow us to align with future state or SFPUC regulations. That is the end of my presentation. We are more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Are there any clarifying questions from city council before we open the public hearing? I would like to open the public hearing. City Clerk Heron, please call for public comment on this item. Thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on our second public hearing, item G2, introduce an ordinance to amend municipal code chapter 7.35 on water conservation, which provides for enforcement of conservation measures in the water shortage contingency plan. Please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine now. This will be the final call for public comment on our second public hearing, item G2. Seeing no hands raised, Mayor Nash, you may continue. Thank you. 
I will now close the public hearing open and open for city council discussion. Are there any comments or discussion from city council members? Vice Mayor Willison. Um, I'll go ahead and move um, that we introduce an ordinance to amend municipal code chapter 7.35 on water conservation, which provides for enforcement of conservation measures in the water shortage contingency plan. Council member Combs. I'll second. Thank you. City Clerk Heron, please state the motion and call for the vote. Thank you, Mayor Nash. So we have a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor Willison and a second by City Council Member Combs to introduce and waive the first reading of the ordinance by title only to amend the Municipal Code Chapter 7.35 on water conservation, which provides for enforcement of conservation measures in the water shortage contingency plan. Any further City Council question or discussion? Seeing none by roll call vote, City Council Member Combs. Yes. City Council Member Mueller. Yes. City Council Member Taylor. Yes. Vice Mayor Willison. Yes. Mayor Nash. Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to regular business. Under regular business, the city council considers recommendations from city staff on policy matters or administrative actions that require city council approval. The first regular business item is H1, adopt a resolution determining the, user, the utility user's tax is necessary to the financial health of the city pursuant to section 3.14.310 of the municipal code. To introduce the item is city attorney Nira Doherty. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I am going to turn this over to our finance director, interim finance director, Mr. Marvin Davis, who will be presenting the item. Good evening, Council. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Members of the public and staff, it is my pleasure to present this item tonight. Uh, my name is Marvin Davis. I am the uh, City's interim finance director. We're asking the council to adopt a resolution attached to the staff report, determining that the utility user's tax is necessary for the financial health of the city for the fiscal years 2021 and 2022. And so by way of background, uh, the city's municipal code section 3.14 requires the city council review the need for the UUT every two years after June 2018 and adopt by a two third vote that the tax is necessary for the financial health of the city. So for fiscal years 2021 by resolution 6570 the council considered the UUT in light of the financial health of the city, adopted this budget by a two thirds majority, which included a 1% UUT. My understanding is this is a reduction from the maximum UUT that could be assessed. Also for fiscal years 2021-22, the resolution 6635, along with the adopted budget, passed by a two third majority, and this included also 1% UUT, again, lower than the maximum amount. The analysis that my staff and I reviewed indicated that the city received about 1.44 million in UUT for fiscal year 2021-22. And the most recent budget anticipates 1.74 for the current period. And as of December, the end of December, we've received about 800,000. Now, absent these monies, the general fund would be less approximately 3.2 million in receipts. And so we wouldn't have received approximately that amount. What I looked at it, when I determined um, how to comply with the, uh, with the law, is there has to be a definition of financial health. It's kind of seemed 
needs to be a definition. So financial health is, I consider it as well as, well as consulting with some of the uh, uh, consultants is that the funding of ongoing services should be funded with ongoing revenues. This is one uh, element of financial health. Police, safety, these type of things should be funded with ongoing revenues. Also, as part of financial health, you gotta consider obviously whether adequate reserves are in place. Uh, the city currently has a AAA bond rating, so the city has done a good job in determining uh, that there are adequate reserves. And then overarching everything is that there are adequate uh, services. Uh, obviously, if the community says you're not really providing the level of services, then you have to consider that in terms of the financial help. So we consider, uh, my staff and I consider these parameters Based upon these parameters, we determined that the UUT was necessary or we believe it's necessary for those two fiscal periods. And so uh, this is the resolution for those two fiscal periods. And we have, uh, I'd be willing to take questions and if I can't answer them, I'll give them a Justin. <laughs> but uh, is, if, if there's any questions concerning how we arrived at it or, or the methodology we used. Thank you very much. Are there any clarifying questions from council members? All right, City Clerk Heron, please call for public comment on this item. Thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on regular business item H1, adopt a resolution determining the user utility tax is necessary to the financial health of the city pursuant to section 3.14.310 of the municipal code. Please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine now. And our first speaker will be a Dean 11. Good evening. Uh, Mayor and council members, Dean 11, uh, Menlo Park resident. And um, uh, let's see, I'm on Complete Streets Commission, I'm completely speaking for myself here. And um, on this issue, um, I am not a finance expert and I am in no way a legal expert. And um, I, I think I uh, observed uh, the process around this tax out of the corner of my eye while, you know, attending city council members for mostly transportation related purposes over the year. And so I saw that this uh, tax, uh, it, it initially passed, and then there was a process that was done every year or two or something to affirm the tax in the budget, which I, I think I vaguely remember looking and saying, oh, well, why are they doing this step? I guess this is something that needs to be done um, as a formal step in order to be able to approve the tax. And it seemed like a very uneventful thing that was done. And um, my, my understanding is that there was at some point when there was that uh, formal step that needed to be done and it was not done by accident. And um, in, in general, when there are formal steps in a bureaucratic process that you don't do, like you forget to fill in a form that needs to be sent in every couple of years and forget, there is often some way to correct that process. And if that is in fact what is uh, going on here, then um, I would encourage the city council to, to do so um, since in terms of is this uh, money needed for the city budget, um, as we are as a city recovering from the impacts of COVID and really wanting to be able to restore city services and revive our downtown and be able to move forward um, with, uh, you know, parks and transportation and um, other things that our citizenry um, expects from the city, it would be 
uh, not great to go into budget season and say, okay, we need to remove this funding that the residents have been expecting to be able to pay for the city services and instead need to be able to go into the budget season looking to make cuts, even as we're trying to continue to restore and recover the for the pandemic. So I do urge the city council to take this motion and keep our budget whole for the services and needs of the city. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be James Pistorino. There we go, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Great, hi, this is James Pistorino and I am just calling in to speak of solely on behalf of myself. Um, and I, I just did want to comment because I think based on the description of what the uh, resolution is in front of the uh, city council, I think the description is inaccurate. Um, I think it was described as that you were going to make tonight, make a finding that whether or not the UUT uh, uh, was uh, necessary for the financial health, whether it was necessary back in uh, 2020 and uh, 2021. And that's not correct, I, I believe. Um, if you look at item number one on the proposed resolution, it says not that you're making a finding tonight, but that you made one, again, back in 2021, uh, for in, uh, paragraph number one and number two, um, or for the fiscal year 2020 to 2021, and that you made one back uh, when it was adopted for 2021 and 2022. So not that you're making a finding tonight, but that you made one in the past. So I, I I'd encourage you to really think about what the actual resolution you're being asked to uh, adopt is. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And our next speaker will be phone number ending in 6751. And again, if you could just state your name for the record preceding your comment. So this is called- Hi, can you hear me? Oh, yes, perfect. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry, yes. Uh, uh, this, uh, again, my name is Victor Pathier. And um, I'm just um, agreeing with what James just said. Um, and, and not only that, but uh, we've been through a lot in the last two years. Uh, as you are aware of the economic uh, impact that everything has gone up anywhere from five to 20% for all, all, all goods and services, okay? Uh, and not only that, but you know as well as I do that uh, PUCO just gave the, our pg and &E, you know, a raise to raise us again, and they got, they got another one coming up soon again. Now, you're gonna turn right around with this new uh, bill that you keep uh, tax, and you're going to go ahead and t tax, you know, again, your utilities and water, cable, and so forth. Um, at what point, at a fixed income individual like myself, where are we supposed to get all this money from? Because, you know, we don't get that 3% or 4% raise every year. Um, while everything else is, is, is doubling, basically. So for every 3% I get, I'm probably falling behind 3% of more. Um, but you got to think about the customers in, in, in your community and how it, this is going to impact their livelihood. Um, and, and, but then you guys turn around and spending $5.7 million on this project, on Bell Haven. Um, you know, like, I just don't understand that. You're pushing everybody to go into electric mode so quickly without really, really thinking about the consequences down the road. You know, if we're all in electric and if something goes wrong, you know, we have nothing, no backup. You're passing laws left and right that you can't use gas. You, you can't use generators, if, you know, if your house goes out because they're running gas. Um, where, 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 where is it going to end, you know, to where 
you guys need to start thinking about who you guys are working for. You are working for the people of this town who voted you guys people in. Now, here's another example. You guys just ordered Teslas. You know, I, I, to me, I, I don't understand that. You, you're buying a car for the police department that are, are small to start with. Why couldn't you just buy yourself, you know, the uh, EcoSport, uh, the, the Ford EcoSports, you know, uh, have, you know, replace those for twenty three, twenty four thousand dollars or $26,000 dollars instead of you paying two or three times the price. So, anyways, that's, that's what I got to say. I, I just don't think it's the right time to do this. I think you should send letters to all your, all your customers, all your people in this town, let them know what's going on, and, and, and reestablish a new date, and let everybody be aware of what's going on here on this vote. I, I think you just, guys should just go ahead and freeze this for now. Wait two or three months. Let everybody know. Send them all an email or send them all a postcard like you do when you have a new construction in your neighborhood. And by that time, everybody's aware of what's going on. And then if everybody you know, votes on this and, uh, and agrees to it, so be it. But I think council members need to start thinking about their customers first. And especially the impact it's going to have the older generation in this area. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So this will be the final call for public comment on item H1. Our next speaker will be P. Hartwell. Hi, this is this is Caitlin, and um, I'm speaking on my behalf. And it's curious to me that um, a handful of months ago, the council said, we're gonna raise the UUT to the maximum effect of 3.5% so we can pay to put electric into low-income housing. There was no notion or voice about, hey, we really need this money to operate our city. It was like, oh, hey, you know, I want to just keep spending spending the public's money, and I think this is a good idea to go electrify the east side of town who can't afford it. So I'm going to just take it from the UUT, and we're going to go spend it. Let's raise the tax to 3.5%. And now we find out that they've illegally been collecting the money. And now there's this dire need for it to be to operate the city, which actually isn't what they've been saying. Additionally, the state has given a grant to our city to for safety services. I understand that there's three council people that refuse to use that money for our protective forces. So I don't understand why, where this need is coming in if there's grant money set, set aside that we're not touching. So I don't think that you can spend more than you bring in. And I think everybody needs to take a hard look at what they're spending rather than just throwing our money to caution. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And so now the final call for public comment on item H1. Seeing no further hands raised, Mayor Nash, you may continue. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the public commenters. Um, City Attorney Doherty, uh, would you like to address some of the comments, please? Sure, I'm happy to address any of the comments that the council would like addressed. Um, I will uh, voluntarily address the comment by Mr. James Pistorino um, and just state that I uh, tend to agree with his assertion that the first section um, of the proposed resolution that's before you tonight indeed does ask the city council um, to find and determine that the city council made a finding um, of necessity regarding the financial health in uh, for budget year 2020 and 2021. 
And if there are any other questions, I'd be happy to address any others. Mayor Nash, may I speak? Please. Yeah, so I just want to say I appreciate uh, the comments this evening from all who commented, but I'd like to clarify some items for the public. Um, so in 2020-2021, the city of Menlo Park faced a grave financial crisis from the pandemic. And we went through a, uh, a painful budget process. What we are doing tonight is recognizing the discussion that actually took place that evening, where we actually debated whether or not to raise the UUT. To say that we didn't make a finding that night when we debated it, there was discussion and disagreement is false. We did. We made a finding that evening and we voted on it. And so tonight the resolution is memorializes that. And it was a painful process to go through the budget that year. And we absolutely relied upon the historical set UUT we had in place in Menlo Park for years to balance that budget and deliver critical services to Menlo Park residents. Now to those tonight who have come to speak about the perspective that in the future, the UUT would be raised, it hasn't been raised yet. And what we're doing tonight is not raising it. All we're doing tonight is saying where we have had the UUT set historically in the past, we made a finding within that budget to maintain it to deliver critical services. So I want everyone to understand we're not raising the UUT this evening. We're simply maintaining it. We're simply recognizing that we discussed it that evening and maintained it where it had been historically to deliver those services through the pandemic. And I think that's really important for people to understand because while there was, uh, there was uh, an instruction that evening to look at raising the UUT in the future for purposes that the council disagreed on, it did not go in place that evening to do so and still has not. And that may be, be something the council discusses at a future date. So I wanted to make that clear for people to understand tonight when we vote on this resolution that all we're doing right now is recognizing, memorializing a discussion that we had and the findings we made that evening so that the record is very clear, which could be clear as well if we just simply attached a copy of the minutes of that meeting verbatim of what was discussed. But putting together a document like this is actually quite clarifying. Now, with respect to other items that people have talked about, look, we understand people are hurting right now. I personally, and I know I don't know where my colleagues are on this, but where I personally believe we should hold the UUT where it is and where it has historically been and not raise it for the and for many of the reasons people have talked about. But that is a discussion for a later date. And what I would say to those who would say that we should disgorge the city from the from the UUT from that year, 2020, 2021. First, the record doesn't support it. But secondly, do we, how could you make the argument that during the pandemic, when we laid off so many staff, when we worked so hard just to have police services and, and roads and, and sewer and everything that we had to do as a city that we didn't need that money at that time. I can't think of a time more during my tenure in city council than, than that we needed it than at that moment. So I, I thank you, I thank everyone for speaking this evening, but I just really wanted to clarify where we were and what we were doing this evening. And all the debates that everyone wants to have about the future, we'll have them. But tonight is about pre preserving the city and actually clarifying a record which already existed. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Mueller. Are there any other comments or um, would someone like to make the motion? I move. I'll second. Thank you. City Clerk Heron, please state the motion and call for a vote. Thank you, Mayor Nash. Uh, so the motion on the floor is by City Council Member Combs with a second by Vice Mayor Willison to adopt a resolution determining that the UUT is necessary for the financial health of the city for fiscal years 2020, 21, and 21, in 2021 to 2022. Um, and just through the city attorney, do we need to note the 
Anything in the resolution, in the motion? No. Thank you. Any further city council question or discussion? Seeing no hands, by roll call vote. City Council Member Combs? Yes. City Council Member Mueller? Yes. City Council Member Taylor? Yes. Vice Mayor Willison? Yes. Mayor Nash? Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Council Member Combs, I see your light on. Thanks. So, so I am mindful as uh, one of the public commenters <clears throat> stated that the last direction um, future perspective direction given by the council regarding the UUT was to look at raising it and using it as part of uh, the implementation of, of a CAP program. Um, uh, I would uh, like to make a motion or suggest that the council give direction to staff at this time to, to pause that direction and, and so that there won't be any, to make it clear, there won't be any staff work looking at any changes to the UUT and any usages of it in connection with CAP or anything else um, uh, until that item is, is, is back before council. And, and I'll um, obviously come to my, my colleagues uh, to see if there's any support, but, but also first go to the, city, the interim city manager to see that if, if that is, the direction is constructed in a way that, that makes sense to you. Uh, yes, uh, council member Combs, I believe I understand uh, that that instruction. So I just would maybe, um, as you said, look to your council colleagues, but also look to the city attorney in terms of whether that's uh, needed in the form of a motion or in general uh, direction to staff to place a pause. As, as you know, we do have quite a few uh, vacancies these days and uh, the ability for staff to proceed um, is, uh, is, would be challenging otherwise, but it would be nice to have the clear direction from council. A general direction to the city manager with um, some consensus from the council, I think would be sufficient here. Vice Mayor Willison. Um, yeah, um, Council Member Combs, um, I actually agree with you on this given the public um, conversation around this. Um, it's actually been, you know, kind of a blessing that the staff has not had an opportunity to work on it. And I agree um, in pausing it so that we can have a discussion in the future. Um, much appreciated. Council Member Mueller, Council Member Taylor. And I will just say, I also agree. Yeah, I'm in agreement and to those who are watching who expressed concerns this evening about the prior item that we voted on, I hope this goes to allay those concerns. So to be very clear, if we give this direction, the UUT will not be worked on on being raised and will be maintained at historical levels until there is a discussion later by council, which will be given proper notice to all the public. Council May. Mayor Nash, I agree. Thank you very much. Excellent. All right, um, there's been a request to have a break at this point. Why don't we um, come back at uh, 8.05, please? Thank you.
having all of our city council members return to our virtual and in-person dates. Mayor Nash, you may reconvene the meeting. Thank you. The next regular business item is H2, adopt a resolution to install no parking restrictions on a portion of El Camino Real and timed parking restrictions on a portion of College Avenue. To introduce the item is Senior Transportation Engineer, Christiane Choi. Good evening, uh, Mayor Nash, City Council members. Uh, can, can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so again, I'm Christiane Choi, Senior Transportation Engineer with the City's Transportation Division. Tonight, I'll be presenting on the proposed parking restrictions on El Camino Real and College Avenue. The presentation will be include We'll include um, a background of this project, our evaluation, feedback from the Complete Streets Commission meeting, and then our re recommended council action. So currently, uh, Stanford University is constructing the Middle Plaza development on El Camino Real. It's a mixed use project, including retail and restaurant uses, uh, office uses, as well as residential. This project is expected to be completed in 2022, and it has a number of off-site improvements that are required, including modifying the intersection at El Camino Real and Middle Avenue, which is one of the primary access points to the project site. Recent studies for El Camino Real have also identified future bike facilities. In 2015, the city undertook a corridor study for El Camino Real to look at different design options. Um, one of the desired outcomes um, from that study indicated that people wanted to see enhanced pedestrian um, crossing and um, safety, as well as inclusion of bicycle lanes. So the council did accept that study and identified buffered bike lanes as the preferred alternative. Then in 2020, uh, the city council also adopted the transportation master plan, which identified a number of transportation improvement projects around the city, including buffered bike lanes on El Camino within the city limits. And then the city has also been participating in the peninsula bikeway study, along with other uh, cities along the peninsula, including Palo Alto, Redwood City and Mountain View. And that study has identified El Camino as the preferred alternative for a low stress uh, separated bikeway. Now currently the El Camino um, Real and Middle Avenue intersection has one crosswalk um, crossing Middle Avenue on the North Way. As part of the improvements that Stanford is constructing um, at this intersection, they would be adding a new crosswalk on the South Leg um, to complete the pedestrian crossings at this intersection. In addition, currently there is um, these flexible posts that separate the um, two directions of travel on El Camino at this location. And so as part of the improvements, there will also, Stanford would also be constructing a two foot wide raised concrete median that would provide better separation between um, the opposite directions of travel, as well as to provide um, more consistent median on El Camino Real. However, the width of um, El Camino in this location is not wide enough to include both the raised median and parking. And so um, this, so staff is recommending that parking be removed on this west side of um, El Camino Real. We did look at um, possibly placing the median a little closer to the middle plaza development property. However, it was determined to be infeasible. Um, and given that um, El Camino is a uh, state facility, um, these plans were also submitted and approved by Caltrans. So in, in anticipation of the future um, bike lanes on El Camino, staff is also recommending that we remove the parking on the east side of El Camino that's from along the middle plaza um, frontage, as well as the Stanford Park Hotel to the south city limits with Palo Alto. 
this would be approximately 67 parking spaces. Both the um, Middle Plaza development as well as the Stanford Park Hotel have um, parking lots that um, on-site parking lots that can provide parking for their employees, um, guests, and um, residents. In addition, Stanford is also um, building a, a new connection between the Middle Plaza development and the, um, the hotel that um, will be located at the rear of the site. This will allow for the hotel guests to have access to um, the El Camino Real and Cambridge Avenue intersection. So staff presented this item to the Complete Streets Commission at their um, January meeting. We um, heard concerns about how um, the parking removal would impact the small businesses on the west side of El Camino, um, as well as um, the Stanford Park Hotel representatives um, spoke about um, using the parking in front of their hotel on El Camino um, for their buses to load and unload and sometimes have um, overnight parking um, there for their buses um, because their buses find it hard to maneuver within their parking lot. Staff did share the proposed new connection um, to the Middle Plus development with the hotel representatives and also put them in contact with the Middle Plaza development team. After some discussion, the commission did approve the um, parking removal, but also directed staff to look at parking options for the small businesses on the west side and, um, and also to observe existing parking conditions. So following the Complete Streets Commission meeting, staff um, went out to observe um, the parking on El Camino and College Avenue. It was found that the parking on El Camino is um, currently not heavily utilized. This is expected due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So we also reviewed the um, Google Street View history, um, and there were about 19 instances uh, where parking was recorded. And um, of those 19, one date was shown to have seven vehicles parked there, but typically the range was three to five vehicles um, observed. So on College Avenue, the north side of um, College has one to two um, one hour, park, or one hour parking spaces that could accommodate one to two um, cars. And then on the south side, there's um, about six to seven parking spaces that are unrestricted. West of this parking area, the parking is um, restricted by residential parking permit. So on the south side of um, College Avenue, the parking that was observed was um, about four to five vehicles parked there. They were both observed in the morning and the afternoon, um, indicating to staff that these park cars were parked there for multiple hours. And so staff's recommending that this um, parking be converted to one hour parking to encourage parking turn turnover and increase the parking availability um, in the area. Um, staff has also spoken with uh, two of the property tenants and um, uh, property owners um, who are concerned about the parking removal um, in front of their properties. We shared uh, the project proposal as well as the um, proposal to convert the parking on college to the one hour parking. Um, staff does acknowledge that this um, parking removal will impact these small businesses and that the, um, the parking along college is, while well, would be, provide availability um, close by is not as convenient. Um, for their customers. However, in order to construct the raised um, concrete median, staff is recommending that the council adopt the resolution to remove the eight parking spaces on El Camino on the west side between Middle and College Avenues, and also on the east side um, between, um, well, along the Middle Plaza parking frontage south to the city limits with Palo Alto and then to also install one hour parking on the south side of college, um, Mondays through Fridays from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. to match um, other areas in the city, as well as updating the north side of college to match those same hours. So that concludes my presentation and happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Are there any clarifying questions from council? before we go to public comment. All right, 
Um, City Clerk Heron, please call for public comment on this item. Thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on regular item <coughs> to adopt a resolution to install no parking restrictions on a portion of El Camino and timed parking restrictions on a portion of College Avenue, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine now. And our first speaker will be Adina Levin. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Council members and staff. Adina Levin, I serve on the Complete Streets Commission. Um, I'm going to do a, a little bit of reporting and, and, and color on the conversation that we had as a Complete Streets Commission that was reported uh, in the staff report and then I'll make some comments as uh, myself as an individual. So as staff mentioned, um, the Complete Streets Commission uh, did support the staff changes, but we also um, observed and had a long discussion about how the um, small businesses on um, El Camino Real uh, do have uh, parking needs and um, some of the businesses already have uh, you know, other parking, um, you know, so, some of the, the, there, there are some legitimate uh, concerns and that um, we direct, we, we um, recommended to staff to really look for solutions and make sure that there were available solutions. So, um, you know, glad to see staff, what staff is reporting in terms of the results and um, analysis. Um, which it, it sounds like it um, is possible to accommodate uh, this change while improving the pedestrian safety for people who are crossing this wide street and may need a refuge, um, as well as um, pr protecting the city's uh, long-term goals, as well as the region um, long-term goals um, for uh, bicycle safety. Um, this is something that a few years ago from a bicycle perspective, the city said, let's slow down and wait for the uh, region, uh, you know, our neighboring cities for the corridor to work on a, a collective strategy and that is uh, moving ahead and therefore, you know, preserving our options for bike safety and improving pedestrian safety immediately um, is a really good thing that I am glad to see moving forward. Um, um, and the last thing I will say as an individual is I may have um, parked a car in front of the street in those spaces on El Camino, maybe once, maybe twice, and resolved never to do it again because parking and getting out on El Camino in traffic is terrifying. And so um, having clear signs to where to find the available parking spaces is better for safety for drivers, um, as well as safety for pedestrians and bicycles in the future. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be Frank Schumann. Our next speaker is Frank Schumann. Okay, hello. Perfect, you? thank you. Good evening. Um, the only comments that I really have pertaining to the parking is, I mean, to remove the eight spots in front of the retail stores, and giving us the spots on the side. I mean, those spots we have always had. And most of the time, I mean, I've been kind of going back and forth checking and those spots are either the con construction people from across the street are parking there all day, or if they're not, then you have the UPS trucks coming in and out parking there all the time. It's very hard for other people to park there because most of the time they're always being taken and most of the customers are a little bit elderly and for them 
to park there and come down is very hard for them. Um, because most of the parking, I mean, we've, we've been there. I mean, I remember in, in 1960, I mean, that's that store there that I, I'm 417 used to be a hardware store. I mean, they've always had parking there. It's always been retail. And I just don't understand. I mean, why just that small space, we have to take those parking spaces, but we have parking spaces up the street between Menlo Avenue and Live Oak. And we have them from middle, I mean, from college to Parkridge, they have parked cars. So, I mean, I don't understand how the flow is gonna be better going down El Camino. That's pretty much all. I mean, I just don't know where the customers are going to park. That's my main concern. Or that they just going to keep going and go somewhere else. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Misha Sillen. Hi, good evening. Um, council and staff, and Mayor Nash. Uh, thank you for taking my comment. I live on Partridge Avenue, just a couple of blocks from the intersection in question. Um, I have two little kids and a lot of people on my street have kids that, uh, you know, walk around, bike around. There's kids that bike to Menlo Atherton every day. And the middle crossing, um, definitely could use some improvement in terms of safety. And that's obviously why this item is on the agenda. So I support, you know, the safety of those crossing middle, especially those going to school in the morning or in the afternoon coming home from school over, you know, a few parking spots. Um, as far as the parking, I mean, there is a parking lot um, behind UPS. And there's parking spots in the alley as well that I know Menlo Velo uses for the bike shop, et cetera. So there's a good amount of parking already. And then I think having the parking on college will help. Um, the commenter before did make a point that the construction crews are parking there now for the middle project. And that's gonna be over this year. And also if it's time restricted, then they won't be able to park there all day. So that should help. Um, so I think this is a good solution and I definitely support it because I want to see our area become more friendly to pedestrians and cyclists. And I think it's a good sacrifice, just a few parking spots to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And our next speaker is calling in. So I'll ask that you state your name for the record. Phone number ending in 6957. Hi, um, this is Alexis calling in. Um, I recently just opened a salon at 441 El Camino Real. So the parking spot's on El Camino. Oh, I opened it March 5th of uh, last year, like in the pandemic. Um, I took a chance to kind of bring some more community into Menlo Park. Um, and I figured it would be kind of a good location because, you know, it's not right downtown. I'm kind of wanting something different than downtown. And a lot of the clients um, do park on El Camino and run in to get a haircut for, you know, run in for 30 minutes and run out. And so I know someone said that um, they did a study that there was only like three to five cars there. But since I've been there in 2000, last year, March of uh, last year, um, El Camino is always full pretty much Monday through Saturday. And it's a quick turnaround because people are running in and out. Um, but it does heavily affect, I know, my business and my neighbor's business, including the bike shop. Um, I share a parking, like the parking lot behind us. Um, I have two spots and Menlo Vela has one spot. And like going down, no one really has parking back there. And for it to be a solution of College Street um, being parking a solution, I don't really find that a solution because that's already parking. So it's not adding parking. If so that doesn't really quite make sense to me. Um, 
and like everyone else has said, there there has been all the construction workers there pretty much since I opened, which I understand that that's going to be over soon. But it just doesn't give us, it's not really a solution for more parking that's already there. Um, so I'm just a little confused on what the solution would be for more parking than what's already available around us. Um, and I'm totally up for um, safety for the pedestrians and, you know, people be able to get across safely because I, the kids are super important to get to school and whatnot. I'm not discrediting that, but I just think taking away the parking spots in front of all the small businesses right there is kind of going to be an issue going forward. Um, so, yeah. Thank you for your comment. So this will be our final call for public comment on item H2. Our next speaker will be Cherith Spicer. Hi, my name is Sheree Spicer. Mayor Nash, thank you so much for having us tonight. I too am against the parking for numerous reasons. One is as a business in Menlo Park and being involved with the community for the last 10 years, I count on the parking spots on El Camino. That is where all of my clients are able to possibly park for a couple minutes. My senior citizens that I love more than anything, my families have multiple um, children in the car that aren't able to get out of the car, which I do curbside pickup to, and everyone else who maybe I don't know and they become my like walk-ins that I didn't know and now I do know. So it becomes a huge impact and the vitality of my business if you take away the only parking spots that we have, which is on El Camino. I am not like the business across the street that's opening up that has all underground parking, which has across all of El Camino, everybody has parking lots in the back, parking underneath. We don't have that on our block. We might be the last you know, man standing that are these old school businesses, but that is what Menlo Park is relying on is the mom and pops that are keeping this place alive. You take our spots away and it literally will crush our businesses. I know maybe not tomorrow, but it will happen in the next week or two or therefore we know how people are. They need to have a parking spot immediately. And if they don't, they're going to go somewhere else and therefore it will affect my business. So I'm just wondering what the win-win is in this situation. My 90 year old dad rides his bike to me every single day. I am for bike riding. I'm for the safety of the kids around the neighborhood. I'm all for making the community happy, but how do we do this together and not have just one huge business across the street take down all the little guys on the other side? And that is what I'm asking for you guys to make this a win-win for everybody. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be Michael Simon. Yes, thank you. Um, I've worked at the Stanford Park Hotel off and on for almost 30 years. And I know the business has been there for 40 years. And when they've made changes to the development area that started as Anderson's and went to Tesla and is now the new development, there was never any discussion of taking away these parking spots. And so now when these businesses next to us are gonna be about to open, to take all these parking spots away doesn't seem fair or make a lot of sense because these people built those buildings with the understanding they were still going to have that parking. And it's going to seriously impact our business. I spoke up because Sharif did not get a chance to speak in January. Um, about her business also. Um, I frequent her business, I frequent the bike shop. Not having parking there is going to make it virtually impossible to go do business with those businesses. And I would really ask that you as a committee reconsider taking away so many of them. I can understand maybe even taking half of the ones on the east side, but to totally wipe those out and wipe out the ones on the west side is not good for Menlo Park. So thank you. Thank you for your comment. So now we're at the final call for public comment on regular item H2. 
Seeing no further hands raised, Mayor Nash, you may continue. Thank you. Let's open for city council discussion. Does anyone want to start this? Council member Cox. Uh, I have a question and, and my apologies if this was answered and I just missed it. So for, for the middle plaza, what are the specs specifically regarding the parking? Do we know like, is all the parking going to be free? Um, or is it gonna be, is, 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 will you have to pay? Will it be um, you know, validated in some way? Or, or will you just be able to access the, the, the parking there? Again, I got, obviously I'm talking about the non-residential parking. So the, the either office or, or the, the commercial parking, do have some sense of, of that flow. Uh, let's see. So I, I can take the first stab at that, but we'll see if anybody else comes on. But I uh, I'm not aware of any um, any restrictions in terms of um, paid parking or restricted parking. So my understanding is that the um, non-residential parking is part of the middle plaza would be uh, kind of open to the general users. It's of course intended for the uh, customers or tenants of the uh, development, but not um, not restricted, there's no uh, paid parking that I'm aware of. But in our development agreement with them, is there anything where we restrict them from uh, uh, um, from requiring uh, the parking to be paid for? Is there anything where we say specifically that so uh, this number of, of parking spots have to be made available free of charge uh, with, with no restrictions? Because we do have something similar with regards to was it Menlo Center, like where, where Cafe Baroni is, right? There is specifically um, within that agreement a requirement that they that, that they have spots that are that are free to access, right? And, and so um, my concern is, or my question is, do we have something similar with Stanford? It seems as though we we don't, and so then they get to decide how. Um, Aside from the parking spaces that they've promised to deliver uh, re re in relation to that that project, they get to decide specifically like the access to that to that. Let's see, so I, I see that the public works director is on the screen, so she may have some more insights. But some of the, these questions we may not we'd have to potentially look at this to get to that level of specificity. We may need to re review the document. So I'm not sure if you need that information tonight or not, but we'll, we'll see if the public works director has that. Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Murphy and, and council member Combs for the question. As, as um, indicated, the Stanford Middle Plaza project does not have a requirement to provide public access parking, the, the parking that would be proposed and constructed as part of their development would be to serve the businesses on um, that property. That said, there may be willingness and coordination um, for them to enter into some agreements. Um, and so I think that was some of the direction that the Complete Streets Commission had, had indicated in, in their review of, of this item. Um, and I believe as, as um, City Manager Murphy mentioned, um, the we, we can review the documents for um, Menlo Center in more detail, but I, I'm just recalling offhand that there are some time restrictions and, and publicly accessible spaces in that um, uh, garage as well. So I, I think um, from that perspective, I think there, the agreement likely said something along the lines of that there are parking spaces to be made available for public access, not just for the development itself um, is, is most likely the, the differential. Thank you very much. Council Member Mueller. Thank you. Um, my question has to do with the puzzle piece pieces that we really have to deal with here. So is it possible to do 
So for me, in front of the new Stanford development and the Stanford Park Hotel is kind of a no brainer. Uh, I actually tried to traverse that on bike in the past when I worked in downtown Palo Alto and sometimes found myself on that and it's incredibly dangerous. So granted that those new developments are going in there, I don't have any problem taking away street parking. I am, I do have a little bit of heartburn. Uh, however, with respect to one of those businesses, I actually have tried to go to namesake Cheesecake and in front of it and, and park in front when I go. Uh, and uh, I use, and I kind of go to the bike shop there. I, you know, people do park on the street there and I understand why they'd be concerned. And so does the, does the design work if we only do one side of the street there? Yeah, That's thank you, Council Member Mueller. Um, yeah, so I will turn it over I, to Assistant Director Hugh Louch. You can answer that question. Thanks, Nikki. And thanks, Council Member Mueller. This is Hugh Louch, uh, Assistant Public Works Director. So we uh, have you know, worked on uh, a design for this that sort of preserves the long-term um, plans that we have. Um, and, and work that with Caltrans who has to approve those plans. And so to be able to put that median in, um, and as Ms. Levin kind of mentioned in, in her comments, to fit that median in, the, the amount of space that exists today along El Camino Real is really, really very quite limited on this particular block. And, and on this stretch of El Camino Real where it, it becomes three lanes in each direction, it, it's a very tight cross section. There's just not a lot of space available to fit in um, uh, much, uh, honestly. And so parking kind of barely fits today. And even the addition of this sort of small median that we're adding really just eliminates the possibility of having parking um, in that stretch. And so, uh, you know, as Christiane mentioned, we, we are very, we share the concerns and, you know, we acknowledge that this is a really tough uh, situation here but really just to be able to make this crossing improvement as we have more people living uh, on, on El Camino Real, uh, you know, we, we feel like we need to, to remove the parking to make that work. How much, uh, so how much, how many feet are you? So first off, are you changing the configuration of the road to put this in? Is it moving left or right or is it staying the same and you're just taking from the sides? Yeah, basically it's staying the same it, it, and we're taking from the sides uh, is the right way to think about that. So we're, we're putting in a two foot median and we're, and we're essentially having parking that shifts from being maybe seven feet now to just not, it wouldn't, you know, which is, is the minimum that we would um, find acceptable to have parking uh, down to, to less than that. And the, so, but the cars are going to, where the cars are is even though the where the cars are is shifting. They're gonna when they come through the intersection, they're gonna they're gonna do a slight diagonal through the intersection. Is that right? E, well, uh, the other thing that's happening, I believe, at this location is that uh, the turn lane into Middle Plaza is being added. Uh, so there's a number of other changes that are happening here. So the lane lines themselves will shift somewhat, uh, you know, throughout this area, but you know not uh, not substantially, um, you know, because if each one moves a little, it, it all adds up. How big is the frontage in front of middle in front of the the Stanford projects? how 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 large are those sidewalks frontages? Uh, the sidewalk width or or the extent of the sorry the frontage the extent of the frontages, yeah, how big are Wait. those? It's it's quite long, right? Because it goes all the way from you know uh, beyond middle, uh, all the way down essentially, you know, to this when you include the hotel down to the city boundary. Um, and I think we have in our staff report the exact uh, you know feet of that, but it's it's really a very substantial frontage. Right, that's lengthwise. But what I'm talking about is widthwise from front of the street okay. to building, and uh, specifically on the college block. Sure. What is what I'm getting at. Is it? Would it be possible to shave, to shave uh, frontage from in front of Stanford to put in the bike lane? So what I understand, and, and I think this might be a, an area where Christian can speak specifically. You know, are the design standards 
that we have in the downtown Pacific plan call for substantially wider sidewalks than we have today. Um, and so th those sidewalk uh, curb lines, I believe, are already in place um, and are, are being widened uh, currently. So uh, we do have, um, uh, you know, we will have much wider sidewalks along that entire frontage. Um, and I don't have that dimension in front of me, but Christiane may, may know it. Um, on the other side of the street, the sidewalks, as you probably know, are very narrow, in fact, and, and so no adjustment to that sidewalk would be possible. But if we were to adjust the sidewalk on the Stanford or on the middle plaza and, and Stanford Park Hotel side, um, that would be, there would be a substantial cost associated with that. Why would that be? Because we'd have to, we'd have to relocate the curb to, to do that. But so, but, but I'm just asking how many, so, so if we're looking at the college block, right, we're only looking at the one block as it approaches, as it approaches the intersection at middle where the parking is. And what I'm asking is, so that's one, one block, one block, and I'm asking how many feet is being, say, is, is, is being taken away from the parking there in order to make the median work. Yeah, essentially, so the median is two feet wide. So essentially, we would need two additional feet uh, to be removed from, we, we, we need two additional feet, I guess, is the, the simple way to think about that. I mean, it's, it's essentially the entirety of the, you can see that where that, it's outlined in the screen. Uh, I'm not asking for the entirety. I'm only asking for right. that block. So if we remove two feet from the frontage in front of Stanford, with what would that you're saying that cost would be substantial for that one block? Yeah, we would need to we would need to look at if we're just moving one block because the, the other thing is then we're not just we're shifting the entire median and that and then the lanes a little bit and and some other things. So it's not as we can't just you know we can't when people travel, right, there has to be some transition and one thing and another. So we'd have to do a little bit of work to get you a precise answer on what it would cost uh, to do that. Okay, but it's feasible. Sure, yeah, you, you, you could, uh, um, uh, it, it's potentially feasible. The other thing that might be an issue there, again, that, that anytime you move the curb line that you know, becomes a very significant issue are uh, the impact it has on utilities. Um, and so to the extent that we have drainage um, and other utilities along El Camino Real or along the project frontage, we could be having to think about how those are impacted. So, so that's why it's really tough right now today to give you a precise answer on what that cost would be. We would really want to look at that in more detail and, and think very carefully about that because um, it could in fact be quite substantial. Yeah, I mean, I'll be candid. I, at one point I went to Stanford and I asked them if they'd be interested in putting in a protected bike lane where there was actually a separation between uh, traffic and the bike lane where you guys are putting this lane in, which is adjacent to traffic. So there had been a physical separation between the two, which I thought, given the amount of traffic coming in that area, it might be might be beneficial. But the indication was the same as that you've indicated. Well, it was set forth in a specific plan; it would be difficult. Uh, but I've always wondered if, candidly, the frontage uh, that we provided in the specific plan to those parcels uh, could have been better utilized to provide for better bike safety there along El Camino Real. So um, so I leave that for my colleagues to think about. Uh, thank you for, I know my questions, uh, you had no advance warning. So thanks for rolling with me on that. Absolutely. Uh, and I did, I did get some additional piece of information. The other things that might have to be included are, you know, there's some street trees uh, that would have to be removed. Um, and there is, uh, of course, in this area, a, a major pipeline uh, as a, a PUC pipeline uh, for water. So there, there are some fairly substantial issues that we would have to look into uh, to make sure that we had kind of accurate uh, information about what it would take to move the curb line. Well, but respectfully, I'm not asking you to dig a trench. I'm just asking you to cut, cut, <laughs> cut the top away and leave the road. <laughs> so, but thank you. So 
I have a question um, about lane width and apologies that I have not asked this before. It didn't occur to me till just now with the conversation. Um, right now on the north side of, if you're going south on El Camino, north of Middle Avenue, there's 10 foot lanes. When you go south of El Camino, it now transitions to a 10 foot eight lane and 11 foot and an 11 foot lane. And then the 17.7, is it possible to gain that close to the two feet just by narrowing the lanes um, with the, to a 10 feet, 10 feet, and then um, adding the extra? I imagine you've thought of this, but. Yeah, it's a, thank, thank you, uh, Marinesh. It's a great question and it is absolutely something that we've thought of. And, uh, and I think you're, you're seeing sort of one point uh, in space here. But what's happening is the lanes themselves are transitioning. And, and if you travel along El Camino southbound, you'll know that actually just a little ways south of here, um, the, uh, there is no parking today. Because in fact, when, when El Camino was widened and it went to six lanes, uh, you know, and plus turn lanes, you ended up there's not room across the entirety of the cross section uh, to to fit that in. And so as that transitions, like when you get right at the edge of the intersection, you might have just barely enough space. But as you transition towards college, yeah, you very quickly don't have enough space to fit in those extra couple feet uh, to fit the parking. Um, and of course, right at the corner there, there is a, a gas station currently. So there's, there's no actual parking right at the corner. So by the time you sort of transition to where there is uh, parking, we really don't have, unfortunately, the space um, necessary to fit, fit that in. Thank you. You're welcome. Councilmember Mueller, do you have another question? I see that your hand's raised. I'm sorry, Madam Mayor, I, I just had not put it down. No problem. Vice Mayor Willison. Um, thank you. And um, I think Council Member Mueller called it um, heartburn. <laughs> this feels like, yeah, heartache. Um, and, um, you know, hearing from the small businesses, um, you know, we all recognize the struggle that businesses have gone through over the last two years. And then to bring this forward, um, we recognize the pain. And I, I just, I, I, yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, the way I'm thinking about this, it's really conflicting values. Um, and, you know, what, what our goals are and what our vision is, of course, we want to support small businesses. Um, and we also want to create safe, walkable, bikeable communities going forward. Um, so trying to balance those two things, it might be impossible to get the perfect win-win. So I'm looking at this, you know, what are the things that can be mitigated and what are the things that can't be mitigated? And, and pull up in front of the store on El Camino to pop in and grab something, um, you know, that, that quick little drop in uh, right directly in front of the storefront, I, I don't see how that can be mitigated. Um, perhaps if someone needs to grab something, they can pull into the alleyway and someone can run out, but I know that's not the same. And so for that, I, I, in my mind, I know all of us are trying so hard to brainstorm creative ways to, to make that perfect and to make that pain point go away. And I just, I don't think we're gonna get there on some of those things. The alternative parking for customers um, on, on um, College Avenue, I understand what the um, people saying that, you know, it's not getting any more spots, turning, you know, full-time parking into one hour parking. Um, but I think what we're trying to do is accomplish a, a turnover um, to facilitate um, the ability of, of people to come in and out of the, of the stores. And again, it's not perfect, um, but given the, the larger goals here, um, I just, I see it as, you know, what we, what we can do. I'd actually be interested um, from staff. I was looking at College Avenue. Um, if you're heading 
towards university right off, turn on and off of El Camino up college. Um, the residential parking sign is located kind of um, right after the alleyway. And it looks like there might be an opportunity to move that sign. It's in front of a multi-family dwelling, like maybe two spots up to gain at least two more um, spots. Um, so I think, and I'm, I appreciate uh, Council Member Combs' questions about Middle Plaza and about, um, you know, there is gonna be a new crosswalk there at that leg and for opportunities. Again, it's not gonna be that run in and run out. So, and um, this isn't gonna be painless, um, but the, the good news is there are gonna be, you know, more people <laughs> um, across the street um, who hopefully will want cheesecake and haircuts and whatnot. So um, I'm hoping that, that some of that will ease some of the pain. Um, but I guess my, my immediate question now is regarding, is there any way to move the residential parking beginning um, to two spots down the street um, to gain at least a couple more spots that turn over. And I am comforted to hear that it's a lot of construction vehicles. So that might um, be a temporary thing that, that will go away soon. So that, that's my question. So if I may, again, this is huge. So I, I believe um, that's something that we could look into uh, whether or not uh, there was an, uh, we would want to consider an adjustment. Um, and, and I guess maybe uh, looking to um, city manager, maybe if what we want is to have sort of direction, if that's something we should pursue, uh, then we can, we can pursue that as a future action that we could take on this location. Um, it's also something potentially that we could um, monitor, you know, and, and uh, talk to the businesses and, and uh, hear from them and how the change, once, once we make this change, how that change um, is working or, or not working, uh, and, and then uh, also pursue it at some point in the future. Interim city manager, did you have something to say? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, uh, Vice Mayor Wollison. So uh, I believe um, to, to follow up on on that, it, would, it may be better to, if the council want us to explore that to provide direction, we probably have to come back um, working our way through the uh, necessary process and notification and everything. So I, I don't think that the council could um, act on it tonight, but the council could provide direction for us to explore that and return to a future meeting. If, you, if you're looking to expand the- um, right the one hour parking on college and reduce the, uh, the amount of the uh, residential parking area. Thank you, um, Interim City Manager Murphy. Um, so yeah, so um, finally, I, um, like I said, I, I also to council member Mueller's um, and even um, Mayor Nash's suggestions of either taking some of the curb or narrowing lanes. I do worry that if um, ultimately the plan is to do this regional El Camino bike network and to have bikes going by, um, the door zone is a huge concern for people on bikes and for the members of the public who don't know what that is, it's a car opening a door and knocking a cyclist off their bike. And we certainly have bike lanes that have that feature in town, but when you're looking at El Camino, it's just um, the volume and the speed is, is, is a different level. That would make me really nervous about that. And um, I would encourage members of the public to um, reacquaint themselves with a 2015 study as well um, about El Camino Real and kind of what the vision is for El Camino Real. It actually um, talks about the preferred alternative that was selected was buffered bike lanes on El Camino. I'm actually in favor of protected bike lanes, just throwing that out there. Um, but um, uh, so, so to summarize my position is that um, I, I feel terrible for the small businesses. Um, this doesn't feel good. Um, I'm hopeful that there'll be some um, up, upside with the new um, residents and 
workers coming in across the street that can help to mitigate some of this pain. Some of the pain is not going to be able to mitigate it. And for that, I, I'm so sorry. Um, but looking at kind of the community at large and the greater um, goals that we have, um, I, I'm actually in favor of adopting the resolution um, with the addition of uh, examining adding a couple of spots. I know we don't want to add too many one hour spots because then we're taking away from the residential parking and we create a new problem. And then also of researching the middle plaza parking uh, possibility and uh, trying to pursue some kind of um, retroactive, retroactive agreement with Stanford. Um, but that, that's my position. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Taylor, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, thank you, Mayor Nash. Thank you. Would anyone like to um, put a motion on the table in a second? Actually, Mayor, I'm sorry, yeah. Council Member Combs. Yeah, thanks. So I wanted to follow up. I, I, I just wanna be clear on, on what problem we're solving here. So is, is the idea that, that um, the priority is, is this median, um, this two foot median, or, or is it sort of the preparation for this future bike infrastructure? Um, because it seems as though like um, the, as, as uh, Vice Mayor Wilson was suggesting, like it, it doesn't seem to me like it, it's possible to do bike lanes and parking, correct? So, so if bike lanes are the future, then the parking won't, won't exist. And it's, it's sort of kind of not, um, the main issue is not that that the we're, we're, that the median <clears throat> and how that's constructed won't allow for for parking because could you have a scenario where you have parking the median and bike lanes or, or you, you're making that decision right eventually the the if you're doing the bikes irrespective of the median the parking has to go correct yes that, that's correct if there were to be bike lanes on El Camino Real of, of any sort um it would not be possible to have all of the lanes and parking and bike lanes there. So, and what's contemplated in the plan that was done by the city is the removal of parking. Thanks. So, um, so yeah, so I think in some ways, and again, I know, I know we're not there at this moment when it comes to the bike lanes, um, though the median is sort of like incidental. Um, it, 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 it seems as though, um, you, you know, just to give some sense of, or Mr. Louch, do, do you want to, I saw you came back on it. Is that not accurate or? Well, if, if I may, the, so the median, there's a, maybe a series of cascading things. The, the main uh, safety improvement, uh, you know, an access improvement that's being made for pedestrians is the addition of the crosswalk that's missing across El Camino Real right now, there's only a crossing on one side. And so they're adding another crossing. And as they add that extra crossing, we wanna add the median as well. Um, and at this time, we're not looking at the full uh, El Camino uh, frontage on the Western side, because that's the, you know, it impacts quite a few uh, individuals. And so we're trying to minimize that. So, but just adding that median does in fact require us to remove that parking. And so that's why we're removing the parking on the Western side. Uh, on the Eastern side, it's, it is more the, the other part of the story as you're, as you're describing it. So they're, each piece of it's a little bit different. Um, and, and sorry if that's not clear. Okay. Um, so on, but, but so you, you can do the crosswalk without the median, right? We, we could, but we really wouldn't recommend doing that. That's not something that, that would be ideal. And, and, and as it is, there are a number of issues also related to, you know, maintenance of the posts that are there now and the safety also of people driving, you know, without um, any separation um, in, in that location. So we, de we tend to prefer for there to be um, separation at, at those crossings. But th that median doesn't really provide... Um additional safety to a pedestrian where you don't actually want or expect pedestrians to stop there uh, no we we don't you're correct we don't expect pedestrians to stop there but but it you know it has a modest it, it will have a modest safety uh, benefit so it's not it's not huge but but it is something that is preferred what about the safety benefits you hear in, in some of these studies when it comes to kind of like a narrowing effect when it comes to lanes of travel um you which you can get with parking right 
um, in which you lose when you take away parking. It does then really become just a, a sort of highway. Um, and, and, and so how is that, that issue fa factored in here? And, and this will be my last question. I'll just go in and, and share my thoughts. <laughs> we, can, we can, someone can make a motion. Yeah, thank you. I mean, that is, it's a great question and an observation. And I think um, on certain kinds of roads in particular, um, you know, people think of cars as having sort of a, a little bit of a visual narrowing effect. Um, and, and, you know, there's some, some good research that shows that, you know, streets that appear wider are more likely to produce higher speeds. I think in this case, you know, we already are dealing with, with fairly narrow travel lanes and we already have, you know, fairly limited space for parking as it is. And so I'm not, I, I wouldn't, I'm not convinced personally, um, but again, it's the, it's the sort of thing where I think you're in, you're into the world of edge cases and, you know, the, the, there's good data information about the sort of general tendencies, but it's not necessarily going to be something where, you know, it, it specifically defines what we expect to happen out on this segment of El Camino Real, um, if that makes sense. So, you know, I think given all the factors given some of the issues about, uh, you know, how much space there is if you park and being able to get in and out of vehicles, given the future desire to do bike lanes, you know, all these things and, and adding this median, you know, kind of all adds up to, to um, a direction that we want to pursue. But, um, but, I, but I hear you. And it's certainly something that as we look at, at any of these kinds of projects, we'll try to take into account. Yeah, totally. I think the vice mayor wants to follow up on something. Thank you. Uh, a follow-up question on to Council Member Combs. Um, am I correct in remembering that in addition to the median, there's going to be trees planted in the middle uh, on the median, or is that not happening? Not, not in a two-foot median. There, there wouldn't be foot. trees. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit too narrow. Okay, thank you. And, and, and so then I'll just add, like I, I have uh, in my time on this council been not a proponent of, of removing parking just in general. We, I remember, uh, was it uh, in the M2 area, there was constitution, right? And I'm forgetting uh, some of those other streets where I, I um, uh, again, I, I, I think I understand this des desire for additional sort of biking infrastructure. I, I do think that they're, um, can be lots of, of value that that exist uh, with uh, with providing on street parking, and so and so for me, I, I, I think that those those concerns and that um, that that general sense of, of the value of having on street parking, especially in this situation, um, um, remains. And so, so so that's just where I'm 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 at on this. Councilmember Mueller, your hand is up. Yeah, I mean, I sort of have realized, so basically we are making a decision here to create space for a buffered bike lane in front of the Stanford parcels uh, to reserve that. And that is actually, that space, that reserved buffer bike lane space is actually partially what's cutting into the parking space in front of these other parcels. Is that right? I'm asking City Sat. I'm sorry, what was the so last thing you the, said? In front of the middle plaza project uh, along, right. uh, along college, we've reserved space in front of that for a buffered bike lane, right? Well, we have space currently uh, in the current configuration that'll that would generally be wide enough for a bike lane and there might be space in some segments for buffer um i think the study that we did showed that there would be room to fit buffered bike lanes in in addition to travel lanes in addition to medians and, and things like that and that was maybe at a pretty high level but on a sort of block by block basis that may in fact not be correct. So, so right in front when we're sort of between middle and college, uh, but on the other side of the street, um, we'd really be talking about um, about five feet. So uh, about enough space for a bike lane. And, and it might vary a little bit as, as um, I mentioned in the, in the answer to uh, Mayor Nash's question, but it's, it's not going to be uh, space right now enough for buffered bike lane in that segment. Okay. But 
but how much how much are we reserving for for a bike lane there and how much needs to be reserved for a bike lane how much excess is there yeah so so bike lanes um we like so the minimum bike lane width generally is five feet um and then buffers tend to be uh two to three feet depending and it really just varies by road context um so and, and what have we reserved there five yeah, there's about five feet approximately. And again, like I say, it varies a little. Okay, but is there a bike lane there currently? There is not. Okay, so we're, we're reserving space for a bike lane there that is not a buffered bike lane to go that along that area. Essentially, I, I think the way that we think about this as staff is that we are reserving space that because the developments that are coming in have parking um we're really we're sort of reserving behavior perhaps more than anything else so that at some future time you know as we follow through with the plans that uh that council has adopted uh we don't have to go back and remove that parking at a future time when it's already being used okay but we, but we haven't adopted them yet so I'm, what i'm trying to figure out right now is right now there isn't a park there is not a bike lane there we're reserving five feet well, as we put in the median for a future bike lane. And I guess that's that, and, and in order to reserve that five feet, we're removing, we're gonna, we're removing two, we're, we're, we are removing parking on the other side to make that feasible, right? I mean, really the median, what we, what we, I think maybe a slightly different way to to say what you're saying is that we didn't contemplate a sort of wholesale movement uh, of the median. I mean, you know, we did look at at various options, but we essentially retained the median in its existing location and made it a concrete uh, median, raised median, instead of the much narrower uh, just posts that are there today. But it's in its rough, approximate location. Because um, once we move that median, then we would, uh, that would, you know, involve a number of other changes. And it would also then sort of preclude the use of that space on the other side uh, for, um, for future bike lanes. But the main determination was really sort of working within the existing space and getting uh, Caltrans approval of the plans, which, which we do have. So you got Caltrans approvals for the plans before we approved them? Yeah, the, the, on El Camino Real, Caltrans does have to approve any, uh, any plans. Okay. If, if we didn't approve it tonight and we wanted you guys to go, if I said to you, look, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to be difficult. I want you guys to go back and give me the perfect world and say, we're just, and if we have to shave, you know, shave, shave, you know, shave side, just try to move heaven and earth. And, and you could try and come back and tell me you didn't. You weren't able to accomplish it. But if I said, you know, we'd like, I'd like you to at least try to figure out a way to make this work. Is that something that you guys could go back and try to do? And, and just to be clear, make this work means retain some yeah. parking along El Camino Real. Right. In front of those, in front of those structures on that block. Yeah. So, um, I, I think we would have to sort of circle up and talk about what other options um, we were considering. And I think we'd want really clear direction on what the parameters that we should consider as part of that. Um, some, some options, um, as you sort of mentioned, might preclude sort of future bike lanes and some options might not. Um, you know, as you mentioned, the earlier conversation we had about uh, potentially moving the curb line um, and, and what that impact would be. So there, there are a number of things that I think we'd have to consider. And I see uh, Public Works Director has come on, so I'll, I'll let her weigh in. Thank you. Um, yeah, there were just a, a couple of things that I, I wanted to mention, um, because ultimately the improvements that are, are being constructed at the El Camino Real and Middle Avenue intersection are, are being done as a condition of approval for the Middle Plaza project that 
Um, right now, Stanford's required to do these improvements on a certain timeline in relationship to when they receive occupancy permissions from the city. And so if there is additional investigation, additional uh, coordination with Caltrans, those are all things that we can theoretically do um, and can definitely investigate further, but they may have implications on, on the timing or the requirements that are imposed on Stanford. And if we're talking about narrowing the sidewalks along Stanford's frontage, that may need to come back to the council for review as an exception to the requirements for sidewalk width in the specific plan, uh, because the, the widths of the, the frontage and the sidewalks along their, their frontage are, are very specifically called out as requirements that, that would have come with, with redevelopment of that property. So it, to council member Mueller's questions, those are definitely things that we can investigate. We just need to be um, very deliberate about what is Stanford's responsibility and, and at what point they may potentially be relieved of those responsibilities and, and it come to, back to the city to implement um, if it's not done in a, a certain timeline that's in relationship to their construction. Ms. Nagai, do you know how wide those sidewalks are in front of that frontage? Um, off the top of my head, I do not. I'm trying to get into the specific plan to see the, the specific widths. We may be able to get that to you shortly, but um, not, not right now. Okay, yeah, and the reason being is because as, um, as Council Member Wollaston indicated, I too would like protected bike lanes on El Camino. And so to the extent um, we could take some of the, I mean, some of that five foot and take some of it, but not all of it, and then create a protected bike lane through some of that frontage along Stanford, I think would be uh, along those parcels would be pretty amazing there to separate it from El Camino. Uh, and it might actually solve the design problem that we're facing on the other side of the street for the time being. And I understand Council uh, Vice Mayor Wollison's concern about uh, bike lanes on El Camino eventually on the other side of the street, but they're not there now. And the design configuration that would go to do that, I think would be better to have a well thought out uh, design on how we approach the other side of the street. I am also a little concerned at this intersection to get rid of parking on both sides uh, uh, because everything we know about when you take away uh, parking on both sides of the street on, with wide lanes, uh, which, which the mayor was referring to, you seem to see speeds increase. And we've designated that intersection for kids to be crossing to go over to middle. And a uh, two foot median seems like a small place, like a small island for a person to be stranded on. <laughs> so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a little concerned about how wide that intersection is gonna look when it's a green light and someone gets stuck in the middle of it. Um, but I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm seeing her, I appreciate all the work that's gone into this. And I know I've uh, asked a lot of questions outside the box that we, as we look at this design, but I'm just trying to, I'm racking my brain to figure out how can we do this once, make it as safe as possible. And, uh, and, and then and in the interim time period, also see if in, in doing that to get the best solution for these businesses there as well. Thank you, Council Member Mueller. So I have a few questions after this that I'd like clarified. Um, the sidewalks, when we're talking about narrowing sidewalks, the sidewalks are already installed, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So this would be destructive to actually change the, and also we have trees there. So this, I mean, what is the real possibility of changing the width of the sidewalks? Yes, that, that's correct. And, and I think that's the, um, the feedback that the Assistant Director Welch was providing earlier, the, the curb line exists today. So I think in order to do any sort of shifting of um, the street cross section towards the, the Stanford side, the middle plaza side of the street, um, you'd need to reconstruct that curb, um, which is, is not necessarily a small construction project. Um, you're shifting the curb, likely eliminating the street trees that have been planted along that section. Uh, Stanford was required to preserve um, many of them through construction. Uh, so they're 
um, fairly mature trees along that, that stretch. Um, and because of the presence of the large water line, there's a, a major Hetch Hetchy water line that runs uh, right adjacent to the curb down El Camino. The SFPUC will no longer allow us to plant trees. So once we remove trees um, along that stretch of El Camino, uh, we can't replace them. We'd have to replace them with um, trees and planter boxes and, and other landscaping improvements, but um, not street trees in the same, same general uh, configuration that's there today. Thank you. And then I went into this meeting understanding that with the median, we really, could, we, there was no saving the parking in front of the retail it, that block from middle to college. Is that, I'm now sort of, I'm not clear that that is truly the case. And I guess I should say, first off, um, I think that having a median is very critical. Um, there are often times when cars cut that, um, when cars going north at middle, at, on El Camino at Middle Avenue, I've seen cars cut that corner. I have seen cars um, go through the, um, the poles. And I think that it would be, is a huge safety improvement to have the median there. Also, as we have, as Middle Plaza opens and we have cars turning left out of Middle Plaza going south on El Camino, I think that that will um, prevent cars from cutting that corner and possibly also be another safety issue. So I'm fully support having a median there. Um, and so given, I guess I'm wondering, and then I guess um, the other piece is as the lane narrows, this, the car parking is already narrow. I was parked there today as I went and visited businesses. It is frightening to go in and out of your car. Um, and if the lanes are narrower, there is even less safety there. So what are the real, is there any feasible way to, under the current configuration, to save any parking on that block? So if I, if I may, the, the, I think what, what we believe is that there is not the feasibility to save the parking. And I think that, you know, as I've sort of contemplated some of the questions uh, that you all have had, which are great, and we really appreciate the thinking on this, there, there's more than just the, you, we can't just simply shift a median. Um, you know, it's not that it's not possible to potentially shift a median, but that it, it has sort of cascading effects. And so we need to think about then how do the lanes align, you know, sort of upstream and downstream for that? You know, how does the overall thing work? I'm not saying it would be totally impossible, but based on the work that we have done to date, um, it, you know, it's not as, as simple as adding in a couple of feet on one side and taking them from the other, because then we have to think about how that works downstream. And, and what that might mean is that we're taking parking away from somebody else's businesses uh, somewhere else uh, down, down, uh, stream at this point. And so, you know, it is just sort of a, a trade-off and then it also has the potential to require then a future move of that median as we think about, um, what changes might need to be made in the future. So, you know, the, the, where we believe we are is that it, it's not feasible, um, to save that parking, uh, and add the median and, and, and do the other things that we believe we need to do at this time. Um, and that we realized that there's a couple of different issues that have been folded in together and, and just really focusing purely on the median issue. That, that's, that's where, um, what our recommendation uh, to you all is. Thank you. Count, uh, Vice Mayor Willison. Um, thank you. While we're talking about the median, um, Mr. Louch, um, is it possible, and first of all, I want to put in a plug for those members of the public watching that there's going to be a meeting on Thursday, March 3rd, this Thursday at 6 p.m. about Middle Avenue, and um, I encourage those of you interested in Middle Avenue and safety and all these topics to attend. 
Um, and it's at six o'clock. It's in person at Neyland Park and also virtual uh, options available. Um, but uh, Mr. Louch, for I, I, this might come up at the community meeting on Thursday, but is it possible to make the median have a wider, I don't know if it's called a nose or pedestrian refuge, um, since we're putting a two foot median like at the tip. So the people crossing the street actually have a more comfortable place to wait um, if they get stuck. Yeah, it's a great question. You know, uh, I think we're talking about is where you sort of uh, the, the crosswalk passes through the median and there's a little piece essentially that sticks out past the edge of the crosswalk to create that that refuge um, area. And, and again, this is, is a very narrow uh, median. Um, so I think it, it is the kind of uh, safety that you know, it's better than nothing, but it, it is very uh, narrow. I, I don't think the current design has um, a nose and, and I'm not sure that we could construct uh, a nose that would survive um, at that width. Um, so I think if you, if you wanted to really have a nose, you probably need a little bit of more width on the median to make that work and make it constructible um, is, is gonna be the main issue. Well, then to follow up, what would it take to make, I mean, if we're building a median anyway, what would be the implications of making it wider to have a better pedestrian refuge? Are we then, because it sounds like if we're not going to, if we're either, if we're not going to, if we're doing the median, then there's the space on the sides that could, is there possible to do the median wide enough to make a pedestrian refuge that wouldn't preclude further bike facilities on both sides if we're gonna be not being able to have parking anyway? It's a great question. The, the, it, this is just a real challenge because you have several, you have six lanes, right? Seven with the turn lanes. You have you know, the desire to have bike lanes, you have sidewalks, you have buildings, um, and something eventually has to give and all of that. So if you're just, it depends what you're talking about. If you're talking about staying within the curb to curb distance of El Camino Real, then you could widen the median, but it would be at the expense of something else. Um, you know, and, and obviously that's the kind of thing that could be decided. You know, the simple answer is at the expense of the bike lanes, but it could be at the expense of the travel lanes, for example, uh, if that was a decision um, that was desired. But something has to give basically to, to fit all of those things in. So to clarify, the expense of the width of the travel lanes or an, an entire travel lane? I think at, at some point you'd be talking about an entire you'd um, travel lane or the bike lanes or, so it, you know, the, the, the width is already almost it, through much. And again, it varies a little bit, through, but through much of El Camino Real, you have travel lanes that are essentially as narrow um, as Caltrans will permit. Um, and, and as uh, honestly, the city also uh, permits on on streets. It's they're really quite narrow um, in a lot of places. And, and and one thing just to keep in mind is that there is quite a lot of bus traffic that uses El Camino Real, and we do typically like to have a little bit wider outside lanes to support um, buses. Councilmember Mueller. Yeah, I mean, hearing the discussion about that median, uh, I'm more i'm more interested than ever of, i understand there are trees there but i so but you know what honestly where the trees are we could use that as the protected buffer i'm really interested in looking at i just i i asked stanford once and i'm i'm interested to see look to hear our staff's feasibility on this is if we had a protected bike lanes on the other side of those trees in front of those stanford parcels i just think it's to have some massive sidewalks there, I don't get it. Uh, we could have trees, we got protected bike lanes flowing into Palo, going, going up into Palo Alto, uh, and it would connect to Middle Avenue as it, as it came down. So I'm just not, I just, I'm not sold on this configuration tonight. And I appreciate staff has put in a ton of work on it. And this is not a reflection of the work that you've done on it at all. I just, um, I just am, as if we're going to do this, doing it once and doing it the right way seems like 
uh, and, and knowing and letting you know the realm of possibility of what can get accomplished, uh, of what can get accomplished, uh, of what you have to get it accomplished, I think is something that's worth the time and effort. So for me, that's where I am. I, I am not, I'm not convinced that what we're doing here is safe enough, candidly. Uh, because what we're going to end up with is a five foot, a five foot lane on on one side of El Camino, which really isn't protected, uh, which won't be a protected bike lane, and then we're going to end up with a little two foot median that I don't want my kid hanging out on in the middle of El Camino, especially if there's no parking on either side and people are racing up and down, and then we're getting rid of parking in front of like one block. So I just don't think it's an optimal outcome. Uh, and I would like to push to try to get the optimal outcome and get the, put in the extra work to see if we can get something really, really magnificent. City Manager Murphy. Uh, let's see, so uh, thank you, Mayor. So um, definitely appreciate all the uh, uh, questions, input. Uh, I would say that if the uh, council majority is interested in um, further investigation that we would need to um, been based off my overall familiarity with things there'd be uh, major implications for other projects we just need to kind of come back to the council to understand like what what other activities would not be pursued at this uh, point in time so if if there is the desire for that further investigation we'd have to research quite a bit of um, just purely from a design perspective, but also what the implications are for the um, Stanford Middle Plaza project and then some of the things that are currently um, in, in the works there. So there's, it, it's all at the purview of, of the council, but there will definitely be um, some trade-offs. So we would have to even report back in terms of just the implications of uh, investigating these things further, but that's at the purview of the council. Councilmember Taylor, would you like to weigh in at this point or should we call for a motion and see what happens? Thank you, Mayor Nash. I, I actually have a, a follow-up question for Mr. Murphy and, and that is, is, is there a deadline um, for this project? Because I am interested in having it come back. Let's see. So I, I don't have the specific deadline uh, accessible to me now. And um, part of it is, is I think the public works director identified previously, there, there would be a point in time for which if the city is not able to kind of uh, follow through on certain aspects of it, then the, the developer could potentially be relieved of some of their responsibilities. So that's where we just need to do quite a bit of research exactly about how, how um, what, what those specific parameters are. And that's why I don't think we have that tonight. That's what we'd have to even do the research on and report back on. It could even be some of the initial feedback could be um, in the, at a March meeting, but I, I don't think that that would be um, uh, worthwhile for us to uh, do that research at the meeting tonight. Thank you. I guess I could one follow up if there's at least a, a desire to continue at one meeting, we can do a little bit of that research to get the, that high level question, those high level questions answered to this, to the meeting of uh, March 8th. That would be a, a kind of a, a quick review. That's so I guess I will state my position. And that is, I. Um, I would like to proceed with the project as it is. I believe that um, I'm obviously very concerned about the small business owners and want to do everything we can to support them um, going through this. But I believe that staff has been working on this um, and I don't, I have trouble believing that we will be able to come up with a, um, better solution in any sort of um, time frame, given how, given our staffing levels, given our other priorities, and um, given that staff has thoroughly looked at this 
um, especially, well, I guess there are other options, but um, they did get, um, they did look at it again after the Complete Streets meeting and getting um, feedback from Complete Streets. And at this point, um, I am, I guess I would like to make the motion um, to proceed with um, the project as it um, has been outlined and um, not to, um, not to continue the research. I just don't think that we um, have the bandwidth for it. I believe that staff has done a very thorough job, um, although definite questions were raised. And um, I was one, is anyone willing to second council? Yeah, um, Vice, Vice Mayor Nash, um, I'll second your motion and just acknowledging that safety um, is always, what guides my decision making. And like I said, there is gonna be this community meeting on Thursday that will be looking at the intersection of El Camino and Middle. Um, I know that with the opening of the Middle Undercrossing, we're gonna be seeing kids going back and forth. And um, I'm gonna be doing everything I can to make this the safest corridor possible, but I am really concerned that if we don't move forward, we, um, we won't, it just won't happen. Um, and so um, with that, uh, I'll second your motion. Thank you. City Clerk Heron, could you please um, proceed? Yes. Thank you. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Nash. So I have a motion on the floor by Mayor Nash and a second by Vice Mayor Willison to adopt a resolution to one install no parking restrictions on the west side of El Camino from Middle Avenue to College Avenue and on the east side of El Camino Real from the southerly driveway of 700 El Camino Real to the Menlo Park Palo Alto city limit and number two to implement one hour time limited parking on College Avenue from El Camino to approximately 160 feet westerly. Is there any further city council question or discussion? Seeing no hands by roll call vote. City council member Combs? No. City council member Mueller? Yeah, I'm gonna vote no on the item because I don't think the median's wide enough at two feet. And I think that uh, it's being kept at that size because of the, uh, in, to preserve a unprotected bike lane. So I'd rather the city work to build a protected bike lane on the other side of the trees and widen the median. Thank you. City Council Member Taylor. No. Vice Mayor Willison. Yes. And Mayor Nash. Yes. And the motion fails with city council members Combs, Mueller, and Taylor dissenting. So I guess um, my next question is to city manager Murphy. Um, what would you like at this point from council to proceed? Uh, let's see. So I, I think um, it, it would be, um, and I, I'm not sure it would be uh, tonight, but um, uh, we would definitely need some additional direction. So if there's a, an alternative motion, uh, like, as I said previously, there's um, some timeline issues that we could, we could bring back the trade-offs in terms of um, uh, other, other projects that our, our teams are working on, implications there, but in terms of the full-fledged uh, investigation uh, we, we, we know that, that that's all going to take more time. So I think if there's any direction or an alternative motion that the council can provide this evening, uh, that would be helpful. So, um, and again, it would be a complete stretch to actually bring back anything on, on the 8th. So I'm just, I'm just talking about some of the, um, there was a question by council member Taylor about the timeline or deadline. So I'm not sure if, if that, that that's enough, but if there's uh, additional information that people are looking for, that that's gonna take more time to, to even understand some of the basic trade-offs let alone a full-fledged investigation. Council member Combs. Yeah, thanks, M Mr. Murphy. Can, can I understand the implications of the status quo? So is it just in that, um, the developer, in this case, Stanford, possibly won't have to uh, pay for certain, certain infrastructure upgrades, 
or, or does it in any way hinder their um, ability to actually occupy or take occupancy of of their their project in any way? Um, I, I just want to understand the implications. Yeah, so that's where I, I would say that we would want to even re research those specific implications. So if I can just talk generally, um, generally, if they, um, I, I believe that they have obligations to complete this work prior to occupancy. So if 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 this work can't, if the if if um, they may be willing to uh, have, if the city can grant occupancy, but then. Uh, allow them more time to complete the work. Th that, that's something that could be explored, but we just need to be careful about um, the um, improvements, especially the um, uh, proposed uh, crosswalk there. And so that, that's kind of a key component of this. Another is the, the left turn lane in, and again, the overall Cal Caltrans improvals. So it's, it's really difficult to uh, piecemeal that. And it's uh, so there's a lot of uh, is issues at play. So that's where we'd have to uh, get you the, the specifics of some of those implications. What's within the city's control? What's within the developer's control? Again, what, whether the developer is willing to, <laughs> to work with the city on, on some of these modifications or not. But yeah, the wor worst case would be that it becomes the city's full responsibility. Um, and again, it's a it's a this is state highway. It's Caltrans. It's not it's not the city's roadway. So. Uh, we're at the mercy of, of Caltrans as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add because I, I appreciate the predicament staff is in because um, yeah, I couldn't tell you where there was consensus <laughs> after after that that discussion, and so I, I can understand the challenge of of trying to get to some sense of where where is 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 the consensus if it's not specifically the project that got put forward by staff. I, I am supportive of of the crosswalk. And, and understand very much the, the need for it. Um, but as I said, uh, uh, with regards to the general sort of removing a parking, um, I, I have uh, some, some concerns. Um, and, and so that, that's where I'm at. The, 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 the consensus may be further along. Uh, we'll see with, with the more aspects of, of the project, but, but I, I, I certainly am supportive of, of, of the crosswalk. Does that include the median? No, that doesn't include the median because the median requires removing parking. But there's no crosswalk at all now, like right on, on, Correct. on that, that side. So. Council member Mueller. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify for staff and for my colleagues. So what I'd like is a, for myself personally, my vote on this issue could change, but in the interim time period, what I'd like is a good faith investigation into the design that I was talking about. And candidly, I'm not sure. I mean, if that's sidewalk in front of those facilities, some of that would be could potentially. Uh, I think the city could go ahead and and actually make those design improvements if we wanted to. So, but I would like a good faith investigation into whether or not it's possible to move uh, the bicycle lanes to the other side of the trees in front of the Stanford parcels which would alleviate, I think, a lot of the design challenges and, law, and allow for the widening of the median and would allow for a protected bike lane, which currently isn't feasible in the current design. So thank you. Council Member Mueller, you're talking about so that the bike lanes would be on the sidewalk in front no, of- You would cut into the sidewalk. So, and, and you've seen, and I've seen this in other cities in the world where you would actually have uh, so on this, in this circumstance, you would have, uh, I guess you'd have a strip where the trees are, and then you'd have bike lanes cut into where sidewalk is now, and then you would have sidewalk. So uh, depending upon the width, that could be, that might be feasible in front of some of those Stanford parcels. And so I just ask them, I, I basically want them to look and see what they can do with the amount of frontage in front of those Stanford parcels, and then come back to us to see, because on, I, I mean, Frankly, Mayor Nash, I'm not really comfortable with a five foot bike lane on, um, I've never been comfortable with a, with a, a non-separated bike lane on El Camino in those areas anyway. Uh, and so- I think you probably have consensus on that. So yeah, so what I'm, so then that's why tonight I couldn't vote for it because if all we're getting is an unprotected bike lane, <laughs> that's what we're preserving. And then we get a two foot median that some kid could get stuck on. 
and there's no parking on other side on other on either side i envision a uh, someone getting stuck on a two foot bike lane on a two foot median with cars flying by it and that's not an outcome i want so uh so i really just want staff to do a real good faith effort taking into account what those sidewalks look like in front of those stamper parcels and go ahead and get outside the box to see if there's some way we can get uh, protected bike lanes a great median and if that and and for some duration that means we get to keep parking on that one block for a while that's a great outcome too thank you city manager murphy would you like to make any comments or just do you or do you need more information at this point uh let's see i i, I don't believe that um uh, I, I think it may just be best for uh, this this item to end uh, this evening, and um, we'll start uh, uh, looking at some of the overall implications, and then probably come back to the council to even seek uh, potential direction at that point in time. But I, I don't believe we'll get the the direction that we need this evening. So I think we'll we should spend a little bit of time and then come back to the council uh, with options for the council to provide that direction. Thank you very much. The next regular business item is H2, adopt a resolution to install no parking restrictions on a portion of El Camino Real and timed parking restrictions on a portion of College Avenue. Yes, I did do that. <laughs> Let's not do that one again. Okay. Um, the next business item is H3, consider an appeal of the Complete Streets Commission's approval of two on-street parking removal requests on University Avenue. To introduce the item is Senior Transportation Engineer, Kevin Chen. Good evening, Mayor Nash and City Council. Um, if you can give me a second here as I... Get ready. Okay, um, if I can just have a confirmation that you are seeing the, my full screen and the first page of my presentation. Yes, we are, thank you. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, Mayor Nash, City Council member of the public. My name is Kevin Chen, Senior Transportation Engineer with the City's Transportation Division. Uh, happy to be here tonight. Um, tonight, I am asking the, commission, the council to consider an appeal uh, for a university drive on-street parking removal. Uh, before I go into the detail, I do want to emphasize that this is actually two separate projects that had been previously approved by the commission, uh, which we subsequently received an appeal on. Uh, however, due to the proximity, that's why we're presenting them as one item, but they are two independent projects. Uh, so I just try to keep my presentation as brief as possible, but here's a quick outline of tonight's item, uh, briefly going over the background. Uh, of course, uh, how, how we got to where we are today with the project timelines, uh, some of the evaluations that went into both the uh, assessment of the project as well as the assessment of the appeal. Of course, followed by a set of recommendations that staff is presenting um, in front of you tonight. So uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, we are looking at uh, two locations along University Avenue, one at Millie Avenue and one at Rose Avenue. The original of the original request came from uh, residents of those two streets with the idea that when they are trying to make a left turn or a right turn onto university from their respective streets, they have a difficulty looking at oncoming traffic to make the turn safely. And as a result of that, staff went out to the field uh, to conduct investigation uh, of the issue using uh, standard industry practices and, and coming up with the recommendations. So I'll go into that in a little bit more detail, but I do want to at least share with you some of the uh, existing conditions that are out there uh, using the illustration in front of you. So here are two pictures showing um, the left and the right view 
if you park on Nelly Avenue looking left and right on University. Um, as you can see from the image to the right, uh, effectively you are a person that is on top of the stop bar right there. So factoring the fact that uh, you're typically four to five feet behind the front, buffer, front bumper of your car, effectively this vehicle right now is about two to three feet um, beyond the, the face of curb on university. And as you can see, the, the, the visibility is not quite great there uh, with the parking both to the left and to the right. Uh, similarly, we have a, a very similar situation uh, at Rose Avenue. Again, this is looking on, you know, on Rose Avenue. It's approximately where the, the same location uh, um, Amelia was looking left and right at university. And again, with the vehicles park, uh, you, you do have a difficulty looking at um, the oncoming traffic both to the left and to the right. So there's some, several considerations that went into the determination of the final recommendation that subsequently went to the commission. Uh, first and foremost is understanding what is the minimum site distance that is required there. And given that university is signed as a 25 miles per hour roadway, uh, our standard industry practice is to at least provide a 155 feet minimum stopping site distance. And uh, hopefully the image to the right gives you a, a, an, an idea, an idea of, of how to measure the line of sight uh, from the point of view of the driver on the minor street, as well as um, the point of view of a driver on the major street. And again, given the, the fact that university is 25 miles per hour, the minimum distance we're looking at is 155 feet. So what does that mean in terms of the project? Uh, that means we need about 43 feet of red curb on each side. And this is assuming that a driver is approximately where, um, where the images were shown. So uh, already kind of encroaching beyond your kind of standard stop bar in order to get a, a, a visible sight side line. Uh, so briefly going over the timeline here a little bit, so as I mentioned, staff, after receiving the request, went out and did the field investigation and subsequently went to the commission for approval because both projects fall within the authority of the commission um, so to, to approve. And on January 12th, 12, we did staff received the approval from the complete street commission to move forward with the project. Uh, however, based on our immediate code, any city, any city local resident or business owners do have the right to appeal to that decision uh, within 15 days of the, after the um, commission approved the project. And as a result of that, on January 21, we received an official appeal from one of the business owners along the 1200 block of university. And here is some of um, the, the reasoning behind the request. I'm just gonna briefly go over them. Uh, and then the next slide will uh, discuss some of the assessments that staff have taken uh, based on these claims or these reasonings. So first and foremost, um, the, 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 one of the first reason that the appeal, the appellant stated was that you know, some of the parking along the street are, are currently used by employees of the business areas, uh, primarily to free up on-site space for the attendants or visitors uh, for a more convenient experience as they, as they shop in, in there or, or, or uh, frequent their business. Uh, generally speaking, those parking spaces are full from Monday to Friday, so kind of a typical work days. Um, of course, looking at Millie and Rose, they are very short segments and therefore they really only serve the local residents and, and um, therefore it, it really requires the same type of awareness as if you would at, at some other locations throughout the city. Um, of course, the, some of the, the more common practices of, for instance, pulling up a little bit further from the stop sign to gain visibility uh, and, and, and sort of excessive speeding are some of the reasons why uh, the appellant believe that this is really um, not, not there's, there's some other consideration to, to be had beyond just removing the parking. Um, 
So, so here is a, uh, a slide indicating some of the evaluations and staff's assessment to that appellant. Um, so first of all, definitely recognizing that Millie and Rose are in these short blocks and serve local residents. Um, of course, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, when, whenever staff goes out and, and conduct investigations, we do, we do take into account some of the practicality of moving the car a little bit forward. Um, to, to gain some visibility. So that has been taken into account as part of the original assessment. Um, of course, if there was speeding along University Drive, that obviously would make the situation a little bit worse uh, because if you have a higher speed, you're gonna need a longer distance. And of course, given that some of the, uh, one of the claims was that the, the businesses uh, prefer to have the on-site parking spaces but the convenience of the tenants and the visitors, uh, we do recognize that we, uh, the city has a transportation demand management coordinator that will be available to sort of assist with those type of um, uh, requests as well. So definitely there is resources within the city that can hopefully address some of the, those concerns. Um, before I move on to the next slide, I do want to at least acknowledge um, in, in case the appellant cannot speak on his behalf, that, I, that staff indeed have talked to him and went over these bullet points uh, along with his consideration. And, and while he recognizes um, the staff's evaluation, he, he did want to make sure that the city council take into account the fact that you know, this is in downtown. So parking definitely is uh, a bit more of a premium uh, than compared to perhaps other locations within the city. Um, if the appellant can speak for himself a little bit later on, obviously I think he'll make a, make a, make a better, better point, but I, I do want to at least highlight that we had that conversation in case he couldn't speak for himself. And of course, uh, finally, just before I conclude my um, presentation, do want to at least state the recommendations. So first and foremost, staff is recommending the city council to deny the appeal and subsequently adopt the resolutions to remove the parking spaces on University at Milley Avenue and at Rose Avenue. And as I stated a little bit earlier, these are indeed two separate independent projects. We're just combining them due to their close proximities. So uh, before I conclude my presentation, I do want to acknowledge um, uh, Fu Nguyen, our engineer, one of our engineering technicians. He's the one that actually went out, uh, conducted the study and also presented to the CSC uh, and subsequently got the approval of the CSC. So I wanna recognize his effort and work on this matter as well. So with that, I will conclude my presentation and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any council clarifying questions? Uh, council Member Mueller. I apologize, my, my thing is uh, accidentally. Thank you. City Clerk Heron, could you please call for public comment on this item? Yes, thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on regular business item H3, consider an appeal of the Complete Streets Commission's approval of two on-street parking removal requests on University Drive, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a cell phone or a landline, please press star nine now. And our first speaker will be John Borch. Yes, uh, my name is John Borsich and I'm the one that appealed the uh, initial decision of the Complete Street Commission. Uh, I own the property or a part owner of the property right where Rose intersects university. It's a 1300 University Drive and it's a medical dental building and uh, typically fully leased. And we have about 35 on-site spaces. And there are times when um, the parking becomes a little bit tight. And, you know, we've encouraged uh, in order to preserve spaces for uh, clients and patients we encourage some of the staff and their ten, uh, to park off site wherever they can find parking. And, and uh, there's not much all day parking around that area. 
um, but that side of university where these spaces are proposed to be redlined uh, are all day. And as I indicated, those spaces are pretty much all the time used during business days. And I don't know whether they're occupied by any of my people or, or not my people, but any of the uh, clients at the uh, clients or staff at, at my building, but uh, they are used by somebody. Uh, downtown parking has been a big issue for a long time. I lived here in, in the 80s and 90s and beyond that and downtown parking was always in scarce supply. And so I really become concerned when uh, more parking is, is redlined and, and removed. Uh, I don't know what prompted uh, if there have been accidents or in this area. Rose and Millie are very short one block streets that I think only the residents along there use. So it's not like there's a lot of traffic coming up to university and trying to turn left or, or right. Uh, you, didn't, you do need to be alert when you're turning there and you need to pull your car beyond the stop sign and out to the, you know, say to the curb in order to get a better line of sight of cars. Uh, you know, coming uh, either way along university. So it, uh, uh, it, it but it, it's, if you're careful, you, you do it. And I mean, all the people that live along there do it when they come out of their driveways and, and whatever. So uh, I think removing the parking is uh, um, not the appropriate way to proceed. It's removing downtown parking is very valuable and can't be replaced. Uh, uh, very easily at all. So I'm asking the council to uh, um, overturn this decision and uh, perhaps maybe lower the speed limit on university in order to mitigate any uh, uh, dangerous conditions. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be Steve Russell. Yes, thank you very much. <clears throat> I am impressed by the importance of the parking discussion by the length of the meeting we've had, and particularly the discussion of H2. And of course, the discussion of parking includes the matters of mitigating the increasing density that we must deal with in the city of Menlo Park, uh, which gets us to the transportation mix we want. It also gets to the mix between the uh, office businesses that sometimes move in and demand all day parking as opposed to the small businesses that have been here historically that need a turnover. But I would like to cast this discussion in terms of a very small safety matter. So I, I live here on Millie and frequently go to University Avenue. Uh, it is difficult to pull out and to turn either left or right. I've been honked at a couple of times doing a very slow turnout because the drivers a little impatient because of the traffic loads feel that I'm in their way and somehow shouldn't be there. I think what may have changed is the increasing vehicle uh, size mix so sometimes it's very difficult to see around for me to see who's coming or for them to see I'm pulling out and I'm merely an obstruction no matter how slowly I move. On top of that, we have the school children coming to and from Menlo School and we've got to worry about them. Finally, it's not just local traffic as you might think, but we have a number of cars taking a shortcut down either Rose or Millie to avoid the traffic on um, uh, Santa Cruz. Sorry, I've been a, a long time resident and my memory goes. So I think it's a safety issue, but not a major parking issue. It's only a few spaces that need to be removed, particularly on the left where the people pulling out need to observe because the people on university are going pretty fast and maybe feel less need to be cautious. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be Derek Pexen.
Thank you. So we, uh, I am writing, in, I am speaking in support of removing the parking spaces on University Drive at Rose and Millie. Due to COVID, I've been working from my home on the corner of Rose and University for two years. My home office looks at the corner of Rose and University Monday through Friday, I often watch near misses at this intersection as the line of sight is difficult for drivers. I've also witnessed a child on a bicycle being hit by a car doing a, due to a car encroaching onto university to see past the parked cars. During school hours, Rose becomes very busy. Families drop off and pick up kids from Menlo School in front of our house. Rose Ave is also used as a shortcut when Valparaiso backs up for the clients of 1300 University, they park on Rose Ave in front of our house when the parking lot is full. If the University Drive Street parking is removed, the clients of 1300 University can continue to park on Rose Avenue and use the whole street if needed. Thank you for your efforts to make Menlo Park safer for all of us. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be Stefan Moradian. Yeah, hi, this is Stefan Moradian. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, council members. Um, I have also been living on Mealy Avenue for 17 years, in fact. And um, as you know, Mealy is directly at the corner of University Drive, um, where some of these parking places are proposed to be removed. So um, when approaching that intersection, I can testify that turning from Millie either left or right on University Drive has always been dangerous uh, because the cars that are parked at the corners are in the line of sight, uh, just as uh, your staff uh, showed and they block the view of incoming traffic. And in fact, even pulling in slowly uh, as was described by some other residents is just not a good option. It, you essentially turn, in some cases, you're turning black, blind onto University Drive, and um, it's not a pleasant feeling. Um, regarding some of the comments from the, uh, the business owner on University Drive, you can come tomorrow on, on Millie and see how many cars park there all day long to use actually some of the businesses that are on University Drive. And, and these cars themselves end up having to do the same maneuver that we just described, which is they somehow have to get out of Millie Avenue and actually try and turn on University Drive to get home after their appointments or so on, right? So this is not just because uh, these two streets are small and not local residents at all. It affects way more people than that. And this is a safety issue. And, and frankly, I was very happy to see the city council take that on when I heard that news. I think this is something that we've been um, really, uh, you know, having issues with for a very long time, and I'm in full support of uh, removing these parking these parking places. It's really not that many, and I think that considering that we're removing just you know four parking spaces uh, in the name of safety seems to me like a really reasonable compromise here. So thank you. Good evening. Thank you for your comment. So this will be the final call for public comment on item H3. Seeing no further hands raised, Mayor Nash, you may continue. Thank you. So it is now open for council, city council discussion. Does anyone want to start? Uh, council member Mueller. Yeah, so I've looked at these intersections and I actually support the removal of the spaces. So the, if you go down and you look at the intersections, uh, at these intersections, it's not just the cars, it's actually there's really uh, mature foliage uh, that uh, in terms of trees and bushes along, uh, along University Ave in this area, that makes it difficult to see over, uh, to see through. And so you're, you're having, you're, you basically, as you come up, you have this all of this foliage and then you have the cars and it makes it really difficult to look and see traffic coming back and forth along university so uh i i actually uh support the removal of the spaces uh to be direct thank you 
Council Member Combs. Yeah, I'll just add, uh, I'm, I'm supportive of the removal also. I question whether we have to remove as much as we're removing here, but um, I, I have to defer to, to st staff's uh, professional um, advice on this. And, and But I, I do see the problem. I do see that, that um, it's a safety issue. I do see that this uh, removing parking goes to solving that safety issue. And so uh, the exact extent of the removal, again, like I say, I think I, think, uh, I, I will defer to staff. Vice Mayor Willison. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion um, to deny the appeal and adopt the resolutions to remove the parking spaces as indicated in the staff report. All right, I will second the motion. City Clerk Heron, could you please call for the vote? Yes, thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, I have a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor Willison and a second by Mayor Nash to take the following actions regarding an appeal of the Complete Streets Commission's approval to remove parallel on-street parking spaces on the west side of University from north to south, immediately adjacent to the two local streets, Millie and Rose Avenues, that form T intersections. One, deny the appeal as these modifications are important for addressing resident concerns by achieving the required minimal sight distance for drivers turning onto university. Number two, adopt a resolution to remove two spaces to the north and two spaces to the south at Millie Avenue. And number three, adopt a resolution to remove one space to the north and one space to the south at Rose Avenue. Any further city council question or discussion? Seeing no hands by roll call vote, city council member Combs. Yes. City Council Member Mueller. Yes. City Council Member Taylor. Yes. Vice Mayor Willison. Yes. Mayor Nash. Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Information items are transmitted to the City Council in staff's effort to provide an update on matters of importance to the City Council. Informational items are not action items. However, a city council member, city staff member, or a member of the public may request to make a comment or ask a question on any of the informational items. City Clerk Heron, do we have any public comments on the informational items? Thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on our informational item I-1 city council agenda topics, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, Please press star nine now. This will be the final call for public comment on our informational item I-1. Seeing no hands, Mayor Nash, you may continue. Thank you very much. Are there any city council questions on any of the information items? All right. It's time for the city manager's report. Um, interim city manager, Justin Murphy. Yes, thank you, Mayor Nash. So I do have a few items to provide updates on. Um, and there's quite, quite a few of them. So I'll just try to um, be brief as I can. So one is, uh, this was mentioned by Vice Mayor Wollison that there is a, a community meeting this Thursday about the Middle Avenue Complete Streets. That's the corridor from Olive to uh, El Camino Real. That's going to be a hybrid meeting where people have the opportunity to attend in person at uh, Nilan Park for out outdoor meeting. Plus, we're going to uh, try to have a, a Zoom participation as well. So I think that's going to be one of our first indoor, indoor or outdoor meetings with the indoor being the um, uh, Zoom component. Uh, let's see, this um, early Saturday morning, there will be a um, uh, uh, pretty exciting milestone. It's the foundation pour for the Menlo Park Community Campus Project. Um, it's going to start early in the morning, as I said, uh, 3, 3 a.m. and uh, continue through the majority of the day on, on Saturday That's to be able to do the um, uh, concrete for the foundation. There'll be close to 3,000 yards of concrete needed for this. So um, there will be a little bit of uh, inconvenience that happens that day. But uh, again, 
hopefully for the long-term uh, benefit of the uh, project in the community, the, the neighborhood. So uh, we appreciate everybody's uh, patience, but that's uh, kind of a key key milestone that's coming up this um, early Saturday morning. So there's, um, let's see, I'll move into uh, next week. There's two um, home buyer workshops being sponsored by uh, Heart of San Mateo County. Those are on Tuesday and Wednesday as information on our, our website for people uh, looking to reserve a spot for one of those two uh, workshops. Uh, let's see. So then next Thursday during the day, the city's going to be hosting uh, a, an employee recognition event uh, to honor city employees that have gone above and beyond um, Call of Duty over the past year, both uh, individually as, and in teams. So we're looking forward to be able to um, recognize some people based off uh, uh, nominations by their, their colleagues. So I'm looking forward to that next Thursday. Uh, next Thursday evening is a um, independent redistricting committee meeting where they will be uh, reviewing some of the uh, maps that uh, uh, for, for the first time. So uh, I think there's a workshop this, this Thursday for preparing some of those maps, but the next Thursday, March 10th, will be the first time that the um, IRC will be actually reviewing the submitted maps. And it's gonna be a hybrid meeting, uh, both through Zoom and in the city council chambers. And then the last updates related to the uh, housing element. So following the council's direction that February 8th, the project team is working closely with climate resilient communities and change lab solutions to develop a robust, robust community engagement and outreach plan focused on the environmental justice and safety elements. So we're working on that uh, scope of work in the contract augmentation to bring to the city council at uh, one of the upcoming March meetings with the goal of being able to host the first uh, community meeting the end of March or early April, uh, focused on environmental justice and safety element work. So those are the updates that I have for you um, this evening with the, uh, a lot of support from a number of other people that uh, helped help me get, get that update together. So thanks to everybody for, for that. Thank you. Are there any reports from city council members since the February 8th city council meeting? Council Member Combs. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Nash. Um, this, this is not a report, it's certainly <clears throat> nothing profound, but I did wanna share how uh, moved I have been by uh, events uh, recently in, in Ukraine. Um, and uh, specifically, there have been some, some posts and stories I've read about, uh, you know, uh, municipal officials and mayors in occupied smaller towns who have, you know, refuse to cooperate with occupying forces and mayors and uh, local officials in towns who have um, um, taken up defensive positions and, and, and weaponry um, in order to protect their towns. And so I, I just wanted to, to share that um, in a small way for whatever it's worth, I stand with the people in, in Ukraine and, and, and their fight for uh, for freedom and, and self-determination. And it certainly uh, makes me value um, uh, uh, our, our liberties uh, and, and not to use too flowery and big words, uh, but, uh, but, but certainly the privileges that we have um, um, to, to, to control in some way um, how we want to live our lives. Um, and, and, and have an impact in our, our community. So, so that is, is not a council report, but that is something that has been on my mind a lot uh, you know, recently. And so, so wanted to, to, to share that. Thank you so much. I know it's certainly been on my mind and you said it beautifully. I really appreciate that. I'm sure it's been on everyone's mind. So I have a rather mundane report out after that. Um, just, uh, there was a city selection committee council of cities meeting 
last week and um, the Heart Board members election. There were seven applications. Um, all five members were reelected um, to the Heart Board. That's Burlingame Council Member Michael Brownrigg, Daly City Council Member Glenn Sylvester, Half Moon Bay Vice Mayor Deborah Penrose, Milbury Mayor Ann Oliva, South San Francisco Mayor Mark Nagales. And with that, I believe we are adjourned. Thank you.